But we're going to hell in a handcart. I'm almost to a fucking point where I really don't care. I'll just watch whatever they fucking put in front of me. <laughs> you know, if it's topless football or... Are you thinking about the Women's World Cup again? Yeah. I just... Um, I just don't watch whatever they put in front of me. <laughs> Did you not know that City were a big club? Something was going to happen. And the guy's response was, take me phone and my wallet, just don't hurt me. I've not lived it, so I don't feel like I can feel typical City in a way that you have, because you've seen it from what, uh, what you said, a tune and down against Gillingham it was. You're like, oh, this is typical City. Our typical City is not scoring a 94th minute goal against Spurs to get into the Champions League final. <laughs> This is Man City Fan TV Podcast Raw. Hi everybody, this is Podcast Raw Episode 5. I'm your host Robert Campbell and this week I'm joined by Craig Forrest via Skype and Rob Ward here with me in the studio. Hi guys. Hi Rob. Hi mate. I've got a couple of topics. First I want to talk about VAR. How does it make you feel? I'll start with you Craig. We've not really seen much of VAR yet unless you include the nonsense from last year and like the Women's World Cup, stuff like that. Um, I think in the Premier League, it's going to take a little bit of getting used to. But I think in general, the West Ham City game, when we went to the London Stadium, it was like you don't know when to celebrate. You don't know if you're celebrating, if it's actually a goal. It's just, it's a spontaneity. It really is. It's, it's like the chance to be able to celebrate properly. You you don't know when it is you, you celebrate. Well, that's the fan's perspective. Now, that's you sat in the stadium or that's you watching on Sky Sports, whether you don't yeah. know what to celebrate or not. But for the purity of the sport, what about the purity of the sport angle? Apparently, VAR is enabling us to, enabling the official at least to make better decisions more informed decisions more clinical surgical decisions if you were if you looked at some of the rulers that were brought out when city yeah. played west ham you know they were measuring it with nasa nasa type rulers on computers so you, so ultimately as far as i am concerned the question must be asked is this more about a fan spectator sport and fan spectator sport with involvement and participation from crowds like cheering a goal and then not cheering a goal when it's ruled out five minutes later or whatever? Or is this more about just getting the right result and being a, a, a better tuned, honed product? Because you look at other sports around the world. I mean, rugby, for example, manages to still exist and manages to still have uh, support or participation, even though they've got their own versions of video referees and stuff like mm-hmm. that. American football, while I don't particularly like American football, uh, that's been under the microscope from from media influence for years with regards to TV input and all the rest of it. Cricket, cricket's had all these technologies since the mid nineties. I remember things like the snickometer and stuff like that being introduced. They don't seem to have sanitized the sport. However, it does appear to be a degree of separation with the fans. Like cricket fans just do general singing and cheering and stuff like that, and they might celebrate a run or whatever or or a wicket once it's been confirmed. Whereas whereas football fans, it's more of the moment. So there is a degree of separation there. So what what do you think about that sort of stuff, Craig? When you when you're saying about the purity of the football and if you're looking at it solely from that angle, I have got a really strong opinion on it. I really think that football is a game that you can't wait two minutes to see if it's a goal or not. I mean, the, the line technology for if it's over the line is instant. That would be what you would have to have. I mean, you're, well, that's you're a matter of fact technology. That's a is it? Yeah, and you're never going to get those that. ones you're are never always going to be more that. So bringing in something that's used in rugby or whatever into a game that is as fast, furious, hopefully end to end and played with intensity. You 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 can't have VAR and not lose a certain amount of the the purity of the football. Because I mean it's like saying that from maybe Formula One, is there not a way we can make sure that there's no driver error? You take driver error out of Formula One and it's going to be so... You might as well have scale electrics. Cars. Yeah, exactly, mate. Well, so... what, I'll, what I'll ask you then, I mean, you consider um, the 2018-2019 season. Right. If you were to apply the rules of VAR to Liverpool's title challenge, they probably would, would have finished the league on about 79 points instead of on 97 points. We might have had two more from the Wolves game and there might have been other instances in the season that don't come to mind that where we might have dropped points. I don't know. Yeah. I know there was yeah. an instance in the, in the Cup against uh, Swansea uh, where they didn't implement VAR but for some reason I think we still would have gone on to win that match regardless I think we still would have went on to 
to win the match. But the Wolves game that you're you're referring to, I think if they had of had VAR, I think we maybe would have got knocked out of the cup because you know what they're like with us and you know what they're like with, with the VAR and there was a couple of incidents where we really got lucky and if they had had VAR, I think it would have went against us. So yeah, but that's more of a conspiratorial angle. Don't get me wrong, I'm totally Sorry. on board with you. Yeah. But, but when you when you look at it though, like the the argument I just presented there, well, with VAR, Liverpool don't get as many points as they got. But then the other angle, which is if you're the fan in the stand, I mean the Tottenham game, for example, in the in the Champions League quarter final last year, I'm next to Rob. Yeah. We're bouncing up and down, jumping over seats, grabbing over to the people, you know making friends with new people, giving it the Tottenham fans some, and then there's just this five-minute period of nobody knows what the fuck's going on, and then you've just got to deal with it. That's the worst thing. But that's just us as the fans. For, for for the global viewing audience, I mean, that'll probably go down as one of the greatest matches in Champions League history. Yeah, uh, there, aren't, there aren't very many, in my opinion. There's also there's... the handball goal in the same game. So, so I'll come to Rob, and then I'll come back to you, Craig. So, Rob, you tell me about VAR, Paul. For me, it's more... Yes, it's cut and dried, yes and no. But there's still lots of things to be worked out looking at the one from the West Ham game with the Sterling offside shot, um, armpit, I think it was. It's If you look at all the, the replays you're seeing, the key point is the moment the ball is played. If we're looking at every single moment there, there's not one replay that shows the moment the ball is played to when the lines are actually drawn. So is it 100% correct? Does it need time to bed down? Again, that comes down to your, your clinical answer. Well, my, my argument for VAR, I think on the whole I'm pro-VAR, but my argument for VAR, VAR was when it was initially implemented in the Men's World Cup, it was messy, things took a long, long time, decisions mm-hmm. still looked baffling. I mean, I'm not an England fan by any stretch of the imagination, but there were several instances when people like Harry Kane were being wrestled to the ground by the neck in the area and nothing was given. So, But since then, VAR seems to have, have come on leaps and bounds. I know it was still a bit of a mess in the Women's World Cup. Scotland women, Scotland ladies, for example, being knocked out because of a dodgy penalty uh, decision. But it has progressed and it can only carry on progressing. So I think VAR is, is a suck it and see for in five years' time. But what damage does it do to the sport within that five years? What do you think? At the end of the day, it's a spectator sport, in my opinion. If you think about it, we, we turn up to the grounds every week, up and down the country. That's fans of all clubs. And a lot of football is spontaneity. It's that instant release of emotion. And it's that, that if you're out like football, it makes it, as you mentioned then, grabbing hold of people you don't know, that, that outpouring emotion. That's what it is, the split second. If you remove that, you then potentially looking at a screen for, what, one minute, two minutes, three minutes even. That's what the game's about, that spontaneity. You're going to lose that for that period. But you're saying it's a spectator sport. As far as spectators go, they generate less than 1% of the match, match mm-hmm. revenue. Yeah, so is the game... So then... is it a spectator sport? So... See, there's another argument as well that I'll bring into this. Now, you look at the Premier League as a product and the Champions League as a product, and then you go down to the Championship in England or you go to the Scottish Premier League. All, th- all four of those instances you just gave then now are actually different sports at this point mm-hmm. because the VAR in use in the Premier League is different to that of the Champions League. The SPL as of yet doesn't have VAR and neither does the Championship. So those are actually four, technically those are four different sports. Mm-hmm. What does that do to football, Craig? I think once it's up and implemented properly and it's it's as flawless as it can be, I think it has to be, every game of football has to have the same rules, has to have the same technology up to a certain level. Obviously, you're going to have grounds, maybe Division 1, 2 downwards that that can't have it, and you're going to have to have, as you say, two different games of football getting played, lesser leagues to the top leagues, but I think that's pretty much been the same with with a lot of things since, since football has progressed since the Premier League years and stuff. I mean, a lot of rules have been changed and a lot of stuff has been changed and it's implementing the same for every single level of football. Um, I totally agree that that in Scotland at the moment, with not having the VAR, yesterday I was at a game and it was a very, very, very passionate game it was a very hard game to watch but it was a very a couple of occasions we were obviously split second outpouring the emotions and I, th- I think if we had had a VR yesterday it would have really ruined the game but it's going to have to be implemented the same in, in all the, the top levels and 
in Scotland, England, everywhere, you know. Well, what about games that are, there's two types of games now. There's those games that are ruined by VAR from a certain perspective, mm-hmm. such as the Tottenham Champions League game last season. And there are games that are potentially ruined by the lack of VAR, such as the Wolves away last season for Man City. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which side is your bread buttered, really? I think I've already said I'm against it. I really am. I think uh, with the goal line technology, as I said, that split second, that's that's just, the, the referee knows by the vibration of the watch if it's went over the line or not. Until they can come up with something VAR like that have rules that you can't, I mean, the Premier League have already slightly changed the rules, so it's not as, as stringent as what it was in the Women's World Cup, as you mentioned, with Scotland and stuff. But, I mean, it was look, the West Ham game away, that was almost really good with the penalty, the Aguero missed penalty with the boy encroaching, and because he actually got the ball away from Aguero being able to take the follow-up and maybe get a rebound, he had encroached. And because he had encroached, they managed to get the ball first, took it away, so they said it was, it was to be retaken. Now, on my side of things, you either have something that totally works, like goal line technology, or you have to wait until it's up to speed before you implement it. And I think it's been brought in too early. I really do. I mean, you look at the two games, as you say, the Wolves game, if we had had it, the Wolves game, it would have been a totally different game. And then the game we had it at that you just mentioned that it went against us in the Champions League. That just totally ruined what was probably one of the best game of footballs I've seen in the Champions League for a very long time. I think if you uh, if you look at the overall rule changes in the Premier League this season, I think there's one now about um, people allowed to people are allowed to encroach on goalkeepers for for, for dead ball kicks, right? Because the ball mm-hmm. doesn't technically have to leave the area anymore. You can't you can't chase into the area once it's been played. Once it's been played, yeah. Once it's been played, area, you, can, you can chase into the area. And there's a couple of other rules. And when I looked at all the rules when I was doing my video the other day, I thought. These are actually all rules that will potentially allow teams to 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 challenge Manchester City style of play. Yeah, I don't know whether that's Tim or that, but if you look at the if you look at the breakdown on the new rules, a lot of them look like the to counter Manchester City, and it's really odd when I saw it. But other than that, I personally I'm totally on board with matter of fact technologies. Goal line technology is fantastic. It it works. Yeah. Uh, VAR takes too long, but the problem is they're committed to it now. So we're not. It's not going anywhere for for the for this season at least. Now that now that they started it this season, it's going to be there for the rest of the season. Personally, I thought that they should have found a different way of introducing VAR, or if they were going to introduce it into the Premier League as they have done, they should have done it for very very limited things. So for goals only, for example. For instance, is it for instance they brought it? In I think for? that's too many instances for the for the technology in its current state. Now, if you were going to introduce it, in my opinion, the way they should do, have done it is they should have done it in the Champions League, the FA Cup, the League Cup, and then for international games. And then once it was completely smoothed and ironed out for all of those formats, if it could ever get smoothed and ironed out, then they should have brought it into the Premier League. In its current state in the Premier League right now, I don't think I'm not happy with it. And it's not just the fan in the stand opinion in me that's saying I'm not happy with it. I just think it's too long. It's not refined enough. The looking at that one there, um, and with looking at some of the other sports that you've mentioned there, um, looking at rugby league um, and something else that they do in rugby league, which is the as soon as a decision called, obviously they've been there for a while to have the rules in place. The fans actually hear what the referee says in the video. What people say, they can hear that. Maybe there is there is a case of, and again I'm, I'm going back to the games we've mentioned. Um, specifically well, that's one more level of fan interaction, isn't it? Rug- yeah. Rugby's had that for God knows how many years now, especially rugby league. Mm. You, you, you. I mean, there was an instance the other week at the uh, Community Shield, Charity Shield, where there was a VAR review for a potential red card. Now, as it turned out, I think it was Gomez or Alexander Arnold on Bernardo outside the area. As City fans, we're at the other side of the pitch. We had no idea that incident even took place. We knew that Bernardo went on the floor. But what they were potentially reviewing was, uh, I think, a stamp or something like that. A follow-through and a flick. A follow-through and a flick, something like that. But we're on the other side of the pitch for that. And then it just flashes up on the boards, VAR review in progress, red card review. We've got no idea what the hell's that got. Is it a City player? Is it a a Liverpool player? Nobody's got any clue. Whereas in rugby league, that referee, because he's mic'd, well, even the football referees are mic'd up, but the rugby league referees mic'd up. He says, here's the decision that we're looking at and here's why we're looking at it. Yeah, yes, so so there's, there's fan involvement. So I guess, for me, potentially there, there's a trade-off with VAR. I think 
fan interaction and and celebration and all the rest of it is being slightly marred. But I think that if you have the referees themselves engage with the crowd, then maybe that'll bring some of that interaction and participation back that VAR is taking away in other ways. Yeah. What do you think about that? I think that'd be the way to do it. I know it's like rugby league, so much quite a bit of rugby league. You'll hear a try, and the referee will turn around on a try situation and say, "On field decision is try or no try. Can we check A, B, or C in the follow up?" And straight away, everybody in the crowd knows what it's for. And in terms of we're saying there about is it a spectator sport for the the armchair fan, the stadium going fan? That way, you're going to have the the involvement, the buying from potentially all parties. Everybody will know. It won't be a case of you'll never know if you're a a, a stadium going fan. You all know if you're an armchair fan. It's the only way you can open it up. And, and going back, do I think the rules around VR need doing? I think there needs to be a lot of clarity around them. They need to be very cut and dried. And I don't know if that's there yet. But I think the main way to do it is maybe to have some potential fan involvement in the whole, going back to what I created, fan involvement in the rule definition, make it clear this is what they are. Because at the end of the day, and I'd say Craig touched on it there, we're in the ground. We, we don't see as you mentioned, then the, the, the screens will see VAR review. And I know from the, the West Ham game, it comes up, it tells you in the top corner what the screen, what it is. Why not tell straight away, this is what we're looking at? And the, the penalty decision as well that was that was mentioned earlier, it was a case of, at the time, is that something that was mentioned at the time in terms of four instances, encroaching at penalty? Nobody's been very, very clear and said, this is what it is, A, B, C, D, E, and underlined. But then again, there's a huge a huge topic of debate there with regards to the official's interpretation of a law, which is a, a complete new topic and the subject, etc. But I think that, again... Well, that's, that's one thing that baffles me about VAR, because the referee is a human being, so therefore a fallible human being, and interpretation. VAR is a technology. It doesn't give a fuck about Liverpool or City one way or the other, or any other team involved one way or the other. It just presents the facts. But then it still has to go through a human being. And, and I want to know what why are, why did they choose certain things to be reviewed and not other things to be reviewed? It's so, it's so strange. I think you should have pretty much everything that is of concern, injury-wise, penalty-wise, goal-wise... I think you have to pretty much have it all reviewed. Um, but I, I actually really agree with you guys there. If you had the referee mic'd up, like in rugby, and he could tell you ex as soon as it happens, exactly by analysing what they're analysing, if, if you could have that straight from the referee, as soon as it happens, then at least you know where you stand on your celebration, because when it comes down to it, it is, has to start off with the fans inside the stadium, has to start there, right? So if you've, if you've got a referee saying, look, the encroachment into the box, just check in, and you know that's why, instead of the keeper's got his feet both off the line or he's taking a step forward or whatever, at least if you know you've got half a chance of knowing whether it's worth getting excited to celebrate or whether it's an absolute gut punch and it's like the Tottenham game in the Champions League. If you know what's going on and they keep you involved, as you said, then, yeah, I think it would work a lot better. And I think, I think, I, I, do, I do, I think you're right. I think that if, if somebody could make it more, more a two-way thing, than just somebody in a back room somewhere checking something and you don't know what it is and you're left there for any time up to five minutes, you've not got a clue what's going on, you don't even know, as you said, you were at the other side of the stand, you don't know what side was getting checked for the red card, you don't know who it was going against, you don't know if it was your own team, if it was the other team. I just, I just think that's that's the sort of simple things, that they, the simplicity well, that they the usually thing just skip over. The weird thing about the one against Liverpool was it pops up saying VAR review red card incident and then 30, 30, 30 to 45 seconds later it pops up saying no red card and then everyone in the everyone everyone Liverpool fans included in the in the ground sort of half cheered because nobody had any fucking clue who the red card might yeah. have been for. Mm -hmm. It was ridiculous. And a mic would have taken that away in seconds. Absolutely. Whether it's 45 seconds, five minutes, doesn't matter. The microphone would have taken that away in a split second and you would have known 
whether to be relieved, whether to applaud. As you said, you, you never had a clue what was going on. Yeah, nobody had a clue. I completely agree. I'm a big fan of the rugby league scenario. I'm a huge fan of it. It also, obviously, in terms of being biased with a match going fan who goes to the stadiums, it's a lot less painful for your shins as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, from the shins to the seat in front, I've still got the scars. Well, you know, but... one of the weird things, I mean, I think that Premier League referees look at themselves as if they're fucking celebrities. Now, there's one thing, one argument I always make, which is I think that Premier, Premier League referees are top level officials from any country should be paid more I've always made that argument because the cream will the, the cream will come to the top more more likely than you know it's just a basic capitalist principle however they act like celebrities they fucking treat it as if they're they're the fucking should certain referees over the years have always treated it like this might be the Manchester derby or this might be the Merseyside derby or this might be the, the Glasgow derby or whatever Mm. but I am the fucking centre of attention I am the spectacle I am the fucking yeah. you put that microphone in their mouth it makes them more human yeah, yeah. And it, and, it, and it allows the fan in the stand and the fan on TV and the fan wherever to try and understand because sometimes you are just left completely baffled by a refereeing decision and it allows that, that level of interactivity allows for a bit more understanding even if you don't like the fucking decision at least you sort of understand more why he's arrived at, at that decision but Rob, no, sorry, mate. Knowing the 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 way things are and the way things get worked, and obviously might have a tinfoil hat on here, but do you not think the referees are probably said, in some capacity, yeah, we'll do this, and we're quite happy to do it as long as we don't get a microphone. No, in I, our yeah, face. exactly. No, that's not tinfoil hat, mate. I've got the same tinfoil hat every other fucking si- every every other <laughs> city veteran's got. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, I reckon they personally fucking vetoed that. I reckon they said mm-hmm. we'll do yeah. it. But not we're not doing it with microphones. Yep. Because they're they're bullshit artists to the highest order, and they don't want to. They don't want that level of accountability. Which mm. let's face it, a microphone would bring a level of accountability. There is another level to this though, and it comes down to the players themselves. If you have a referee manked up and you've then got the again using the rugby scenario again, how many times when you when you've got a rugby game on and you hear the referee, the referee will say something. They will not get a mouth abuse back because you. I know what you're saying. So does everybody else. And we have this big thing in football about dissent and things of that nature. Would that potentially not be a, a double-edged sword there? We could well, they managed to once. not have it in, in rugby. And I'd, I'd rather fight a team of footballers than a team of rugby players. So yeah. for some reason, they've managed to boss it in rugby, but not football. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you've you've seen that there's videos all over YouTube as well of a five-foot, you know, wet, five-foot, two-stone wet-through referee facing up to a six-stone, you know, six-foot-nine 18, 19 stone muscle hunk and saying, you shut up, I'm in charge. And then turning around and saying, I'm sorry, sir. And if we can, if you can do anything in terms of, I won't say cleaning the game up, but in terms of improving the image, and by that I'm referring to the big drives within football worldwide of improving the the player behaviour and what players perceive to be, you know, they have big things on clamping down on players in terms of social media, what they do when they're out on the streets, etc., if we have that thing where we do have an official mic up and it catches something, that's giving the players something else to think about in that there's, there is a double edge here. We can we can tick two boxes at the same time. Good, you but know. is that not more of a double positive than a double edged sword? Because think, no matter what depends way it on goes, the whether it, yeah, yeah, yeah it totally does. get you. Yeah. And if it I was agree. one of mine, I would be absolutely gutted. But if the footballer says something that's that inappropriate, is that not the sort of things that we want to stamp out anyway? We of do. course it is. Of course yeah. it is. You so, look at the Premier League product since 1992. Sorry. The Premier League product since 1992 has just grown through the fucking roof and then some. Yeah. So th- as far as they're concerned, they're doing everything right. The second that football goes on the wane, which every bubble bursts at some point, uh, maybe, they'll, maybe they'll change things. Maybe they'll address things. Maybe they'll rein the football egos in. But y- you look at how hard it is for a, mo- a modern footballer to manage their images. It is. I mean, for God's sake, we've got City players now that are signed up as Nike athletes, but yet our team is sponsored by Puma. So there's conflicts of, there's conflicts of interest there. And that's just purely on a financial incentive. Now, whenever they're doing a video or whenever they're doing some social media interaction or when... They're so regulated and so managed. They'll have a PR team and all the rest of it. You remove that factor on the actual football pitch. There'll be so many fucking lawyers and everything behind the scenes that are saying, that referee, (laughs) it's all good that you want him mic'd up so the fans know what's going on, but I'll see you in fucking court if you dare broadcast anything that my, my my player says because he's got an image to maintain. 
going back to your very beginning though, the whole ethos of football here, regardless of the level you're playing at, and obviously the image conscious and the money, etc. Everyone's aware of the money these top footballers earn. If we look back at the whole thing, the next generation of footballers, I'm talking about little Jimmy playing in the park on a Sunday, you know, if he's little local under eights, under nines, whatever age they are. How many times nowadays when you see that, obviously I'm, I coach football, as you know, it's a case of how many times now have you ever seen it where little Jimmy gets tackled, go up, and he'll turn around and start giving some of the biggest mouth abuse. Oh, yeah, Why? Of course. Because that's right. what he's seen on TV. But look at, the, look at it this way, Rob, right? The, I'm, can, you can reel off a list of footballers from the 60s, 70s, and 80s that everyone's got this amazing image of that everyone thinks, oh, what a great guy they were, what a good all-round person they were, regardless of what club they played for. There are certain players throughout history that you're like, I bet they were just an awesome gentleman and all the rest of it. I bet you 90% of them were actually dicks. Yeah. But because there was no such thing as Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or anything like that, we'd never heard of any of it. Really? And because football, the coverage of football back then was was British Pathé black and white footage, occasionally recorded with audio, because let's not forget that wasn't always a thing. <laughs> We've got this. We've got this pristine image of yesteryear of football, whereas now I, I can geolocate a city footballer and when they last took a shit. If I really wanted to fucking put the effort into it, it's so hard to 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 maintain any sort of public image when it comes to the mic and upper referees. I know that that's one step removed, but if I just happen to hear a city footballer saying "fuck off, ref, you wanker." on Sky Sports, it's a world of chaos. It doesn't happen in rugby because I don't know they're dealing with actual grown-ups there. I don't know, but. I just think it's a new. I think it's a new thing in terms of the development of the game, in terms of, and in terms of how they want to develop the game. You know, we're looking out at the next thing. Every club says, "Oh, this kid, this fourteen-year, is the next big thing." We see it all the time. You know, we see foreign players being transferred. Well, United's had about etc. fifty new Pele's in the last ten years, haven't they? <laughs> well, there's but, more than uh, that. But, 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 I thought it was about hundred. Yeah, 100, yeah. But what I'm trying to say is, it's just, you you guys, and I love it, I, I'm more jaded than you guys. I know we're all tinfoil hat wearers, but I'm more, you still look in it, you still both look at football as if you've still got some say in it and some ownership of it as match going fans. That's how you're talking. But then you're still talking as if, as if your views should be considered. And I'm not talking like, well, what's the point of the podcast then, Rob? No, what I'm talking about is you're saying, well, I need that level of interaction. I need that input from the referees. I need to be made aware. Well, I'm sorry, the, the, the 150 million people watching globally on TV, they're aware of why the VAR decision was called because Sky Sports have told them or some other broadcaster <laughs> have told them. Then Just because you're in the stadium... There's only 70,000 of you in the stadium, whereas there's 150 million people watching around the world. So why should we have to cater to you in the first place? Which is the reading of clubs like, I'm looking at the current state, so like Berry, if you take Berry or Bolton even. If you look at the what we're saying now in terms of the Premier League and what we're seeing, and we're saying, OK, as Craig said earlier about the, the, the smaller clubs who couldn't afford to implement this sort of thing yet, is that then with the next call and the Premier League is going to lose, as a fan base, like we say, the Tim Foyle hat wearers to a degree, is going to lose that sort of fan base to these lower clubs and then the Premier League be the sole reserve of the armchair-dwelling majority and everyone else go back to what we call the old grassroots type of football. Is that potentially the only way you could get your... The way I see fix? it is it's in, in t within 20 years, it'll be two completely different sports. There'll be something called association football and then there'll be something called European League football or something like that, where 10 teams from this country, two teams from France two teams from Germany, five teams from Spain or whatever, there'll be some sort of European Super League. That's, that's, that's that. This, the, the seeds right now of VAR and all the rest of the things that have been implemented are just taken as one way and one way only. And then what you watch in Scotland or whether you want to go and watch Berry if they still exist or Rochdale or Oldham or any of the other local teams at that point, that will be a different version of football. The actual Premier League football as it stands now, I feel we're in the last decade of and then it will become some other product. The new champion. Yeah, yeah, I kind of agree with that as well. And what you've also got to think of is what Rob has said previously about Manchester City and their ticket allocations and stuff. I think it all boils down to the same thing, is that we maybe think our opinion should be taken into account, but when it boils down to it, it's such a global corporate thing that they're going to do what they want. We're going to either have to like it, lump it, or it's going to split into two different factions and there's going to be the game for the, the fans and there's going to be the corporate game. Yeah. Well, you look at, you. I mean, like, the issues that I've raised before with the way ticket allocations, 
if you went and spoke to any well, most of the European supporter bases about a way to get allocations, they'd look at you with a question mark because it's just not an issue in those countries because they just don't really get away fans. It's not a thing. Now, in, in Scottish football and English football, it's always been a thing. Mm. So they already don't care on the continent. It's just us that are fucking, you know, we're the scousers of Europe, really. We're 20 years behind the times. Take the MLS is the same sort of thing. The MLS has got that, the same thing now. They don't have travelling fans. Mm -hmm. Very rarely you can have on one hand. But then again, it's one of the most, is it the highest volume of sponsorship sports in America oh, yeah, at the moment? Yeah, yeah. But th this is the weird thing. I mean, like, in a way, I think with regards to the Premier League, I think we've got the best package to offer globally when, when it comes to football right now. And that's a fact. But we're dinosaurs <laughs> compared to the way other leagues conduct themselves. We're, 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 we're like the, the rowdy chavs when it comes to European, you know, European sort of. Apart from the Russians, they're the nutters and the Eastern <laughs> the European. Chav before, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, so I, I just want your last your last two cents on VAR and, and the modernity of football and where it's going as a package. De definitely could be good for the game. It could stop a game from being won unfairly. Um, I think that's what it's got to get to, but I don't think that's the direction it's going to be taken in. The mics and stuff, brilliant, would be really good and keeping the crowd not just interacted, but know, knowing what's going on when, the, as you say, the armchair viewer has got the, the different angles that we're not seeing in the, in the stadium. So I just think, yeah, it should be implicated but the way it should be implicated isn't the way it's going to be implicated and it is going to be implicated to to maybe just be used, as we said, with without the mics, with with the the finger not being able to be pointed anywhere and it's just going to be what it is. There's nothing we can do about it, you know? I completely agree. I think for me, with in terms of VAR, the main thing is it needs a lot of clarification. We've seen that we've only had, at this point, two games with it in the Premier League. Um, I think it would be a case of you need to confirm to everybody exactly what it's for, why it's for, how it's for, and also then look at the in, the involvement of the crowd. That's my that's my biggest fear. They have to include the crowd. Yeah, I know. As we're saying, and has been said, we could. Well, as I've said though, as somebody who's in the crowd, you feel like they have to involve you. They don't. They exactly. No, That's why it's not going again, to go the right way. This is, comes down to what we said about packaging football as yep. a sport and who it's packaged for. That's a decision that the people go to the ground have to make because at the end of the day, that was the decision of are we going to have a, as you mentioned, a European league or your little association of football? It's yeah. that decision of what do you want? Do you want to be a number or do you want to be a fan? Well, let me, let me put it this way to you both, okay? For a couple of years now, we've been called the, the, the fans that aren't really there, right? That, that We go dressed as fucking empty seats and all the rest of it. Amazingly and surprisingly, pretty much 100% of our home games in all competitions have been sellouts. People just don't turn up always. And that's true. But anyway, two weeks ago, me and Andy were, were at the Etihad doing some practicing with our new camera equipment and all the rest of it. And we started interviewing these people that had come to the Etihad to do the stadium tour and to spend money at the club shop. Where are you from? Australia, where are you from? Nigeria, where are you from? Canada, what are you here for? Just to see the ground, just to go on the stadium tour, just to spend money in the club shop. That blows my fucking mind. Having been going to the main road for many, many, many years, people wouldn't even travel from fucking the other side of Stockport to go to the ground. <laughs> us, as, us as match going fans to whatever club that we go and watch on a regular basis, we're replaceable. Not Maybe not quite yet with Manchester City, but you look at clubs like Liverpool and Arsenal and Man United, the big established long historical clubs, as I like to remind us, they don't have to rely so much on a fucking local Mancunian or London or Liverpoolian fan base. They do have those fan bases still, don't get me wrong, but they can fucking guarantee that every home game they're going to get fucking 20,000 coming from outside of that area. And City are, at, uh, City are well on the way to doing the same thing, whether you like it or not. Yeah. So yeah. if you if you take umbrage with the fact that the referee is not fucking telling you what's going on, <laughs> bye-bye, Rob. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've got a replacement waiting, don't worry. That's the peril of having a, a cheaper season ticket. It doesn't generate revenue that you can sell. A, as we all know, I was, you know, from me, from me cast about ticket prices, but it's a case of my ticket cost me X. They would they would generate more money from selling my game on a seat by seat basis. You know? well, okay, so you're talking about we're talking about money now. So we're, we're talking actually now more about 
football as fans. As a business. As a business. So uh, the other week, obviously, was the uh, the Community Shield. Uh, tickets were 35 quid a goal, I think, the cheapest ones. Okay. Some of them were 30 quid, some of them were 45, 50, whatever, depending on what level of what level of padded seat you might have had. I don't fucking know. But <laughs> And then add on top of that, for me personally and the lads I went with, it was 35 quid each for travel, which is kind of cheap if you're looking at going on a train or something like that. We go on, we go on a coach, so it's 35 quid each. So we're up to 70 quid there. Uh, we're human beings, so we need fuel. So that's a burger or some food in or around the ground. That's about a tenner, let's say. So we're up to 80 quid there. And then we also like to fucking drink because we're Mancunians and I'm also Scottish and I like showing all these cunts how you drink. Exactly. <laughs> so whether you like it or not, 150 quid for I would class myself as the average to above average city fan. Now, Easy. some people are going to spend fucking way more than that and some people are going to cheapskate and do a lot less than that. But why does something like the Community Shield, even though the, 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 the whole mantra of it is that it's a charity event raising money for, money for a charity as far as I'm aware, right? That money, ticket, some of the ticket sale money goes to the maintenance of Wembley, obviously because we're using that facility, and then off to some other charity. Fine. But the stadium was 27, 28,000 City fans, 28, 29, 30,000 Liverpool fans, and then a bunch of fucking hangers on and free tickets and champagne drinkers. If you pump all them tickets out at 25 quid a pop instead of 35 quid a pop, you sell them all. And we've made these sort of arguments as well at the ground when it comes to a pint and a pint deal for fucking seven quid or six quid or whatever it is. A pint should not need to cost more than two pound. And I, if you would have asked me the same question ten years ago, I would have said a pint doesn't need to cost more than one pound fifty. But I've grown up since then, so a pint <laughs> should not cost more than two quid. A pie should not cost more than a fucking quid fifty. And, 50 and the club after. could easily fucking sell them and, and still make a profit, and they'd sell ten times the amount that they do now. But as another guest of mine in the past, Tony has said, he reckons they put them at that price because they don't actually want to fucking sell you that money, because. Have you ever tried getting a pint at the Etihad? <laughs> not inside, no. Now imagine if that pint was half the price it was. I remember uh, the drink for the game. Uh, they did have some offers last season. Looking at you here, Rob. If you remember right, the, was it the half price beer deals they had? They were very, very popular, should we say, to get people in early. Very popular indeed. But then again, it was only three games. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the staff can't. It's just, I don't know. It's all ridiculous. Craig, what are you saying, man? <laughs> Sorry, I was going... I've not been down to the had as many times as I would like to have been, but um, I have tried to buy a pint and stuff. And the 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 one thing I wanted to say is that see in Scotland, that's the one well, big you can't difference. Drink in your soul. No, well we can't drink in this in the grounds, but there's plenty of pubs just about joined onto it, you know. So I just think that you're saying about. The, the tickets and, and obviously the attendance and stuff like that. See, in Scotland, they make sure that every single seat in the stadium is full, apart from if the away fans can't can't, can't sell out their, their fans. Uh, they make sure that every seat has got a bum, a bum on it. And it's, yeah. it's it makes for a better atmosphere. It makes for a better game. But Well, that's not true at Celtic. I've seen them put banners up in the top tiers when they've not had a sellout. Oh, do, do you know what? <laughs> you were up there a couple of weeks back, weren't you, yeah. at Rangers? And, I brought you. Yeah, and I bet you, I guarantee you, every single seat was full. They were doing all right, yeah. Well, <laughs> there you go. And I, I know we've not got the television money, and I know the football's not as good, and I know there's a lot of differences, but when it boils down to things, I think we've got a lot more say. And that's why I like to think that I would be heard in England, but you don't get heard in England, you know? I mean, it is getting a wee bit worse in Scotland where you're, you're, you're having to sit on your seats and you're not like stand up and sing songs and that, and it's just pathetic, you know? But, what about um, pricing, though? Pricing is not much a difference, mate. Hearts have been quite bad for the last 10, 15, 20 years for well, more the last 15 year for overpricing and stuff. And their shirts, their tickets for home games and that is pretty much the same prices as you were paying at Wembley, you know? I mean, I spent 150 quid yesterday between me and my 23-year-old and we only went for a couple of pints, you know? So so th th this gets onto the wider issue that I, I keep trying to underlie. Manchester City specifically, I won't comment as much on Hearts, but Manchester City specifically are one, Please of, the, don't. one of the richest clubs in world football. But the fans at this point, are still 
that the match going fans are still at this point working class monk unions. Absolutely. There's no parity there. There's no level up. Uh, now, my season ticket isn't exactly extortionate. They get me in other areas. They get me on those Champions League tickets. They get me on those FA Cup tickets. They get me on those League it's Cup tickets. Pound pie and the pie list. <laughs> they try and get me on the pie and the pint deal. They never do, but... I do my drinking in town, like you're saying. Yeah. Like, I, you know, if I'm going to watch Rangers, I'll go to the Loudon first. You know, and that's only a stone's throw from the ground, so it's not much of an issue. The drinking in Scottish football thing is, I think that's hilarious that you can't get a pint in the I, ground. Let's that. But Sorry, then again, for the longest time, for the longest time, you couldn't get a pint at the Etihad anyway on, on, a, on a Champions <laughs> League match. And, you, and you, even if you queue for fucking four hours, you still don't get a pint always at the Etihad. Mm. So, I don't know. It's not all it's got out to be drinking in the ground. And drinking, like, I keep trying to say, we're fucking dinosaurs. We are dinosaurs. I mean, like, you ask, I mean, German fans, they can take a pint to their seat and it's like, it's just part of their normal life. Sometimes you give a British football fan a pint and they think, they think they're going to start World War Two all over again because yeah, they're thick. But I don't know, we're a, we're a bit dinosaurs in a way. Surely, surely you can enjoy football without a pint. I know, I know that. I know, yeah, well, yeah, Scotland is Scotland, yeah, but... Yes, we can enjoy football without a pint, but these, we've worked hard throughout the working week. Give us a break. You know I what I mean? Let us socialise, let us enjoy ourselves. But that's the whole thing. You see it during the closed season, and then you come back to the season. Your first couple of games in, it really is a case of, it is the time with your mates. That's how you first, you know, I'm going out with my mates. I'm going out. We're going to do what we do. We're going to drink beer. Well, this is the, this is the wider screen. issue of sterilisation and sanitisation of the products as a whole. I mean... I've looked at it for years. I mean, the Champions League has been sponsored by what Amstel and Heineken for for a decade now, but we, but yeah, we couldn't get a fucking pint at the ground. <laughs> it's got it's got Gazprom as one of its pre- principal sponsors, which are a company, a Russian company, that basically annexed the Crimea and murdered a bunch of people to lay a gas line. Allegedly. But, but yet, allegedly, <laughs> but yet, yet we're criticised for having owners from Abu Dhabi. You know? Oh no! So, so there's all sorts of fucking. I just don't get about the modern world and, and modern football because it's all it just all seems so much it's just a lot of bollocks going on. Perception. I think a lot is down to and people's it, perception. And I'll and I'll be honest with you both. I mean like when I go and watch football in Scotland or I occasionally take a trip down to Rochdale to watch football, I feel like I'm actually watching football. Yeah. There's not like this this fucking there's not a big <laughs> stigma attached to actually just go and watching it. When I go and watch City now, there's like 10 rows deep of media vans outside trying to get the hot scoop on fucking whether, you know, Sterling's shot somebody that morning or something like that. It's just all madness. Rob, the last, sorry, the last time I was in the Etihad, um, it was the Bristol City game, I think, the season before last. I started trying to sing a song and I got looked at like it was an absolute fucking idiot, mate. Um, Stand with you in. That'll give us some clarity. Yeah. Tell us what stand you in. Oh, yeah. I'm actually not too sure. I was taken by my my um, ex uncle in law. Um, it was. It sounds like to me North Stand no, it, or Colin it, Bell Stand. It was. It was the Colin Bell Stand. It wasn't too far away from. Well, as close as you can get to the screen. Um, and I've got a problem in my eyes, so that's why I obviously had to get a, a decent seat that I could see the screen was because. I can't really see the football on the field. Um, I never mentioned that before, but um, I just, it's the atmosphere in Tynecastle. It's the atmosphere in Ibrox. It's the atmosphere in Sea City. I would much, much rather, and I know we've just played them, but I would much, much rather go and sit and watch Man City away at the London Stadium and actually enjoy the atmosphere. And I know there's still a certain aspect of those fans there that don't join in and stuff, but... Corporates. Yeah, yeah, totally, mate, totally. And I, I just think if if you're in the Etihad and you're from Scotland and you stand up and you try and get somebody involved in singing a song, you don't want to be looked like looked at like you're an absolute fucking... Advice for you. Come in, come in the South Downs. Oh, come man. in the South Downs. Hey! <laughs> I was in the wrong place. Absolutely. Just, yeah. But the mad thing is, right, I'll just throw this out to you. 16 years ago now, if you would have been in the main road, I don't. did you ever go to main road, Craig? Not on game day, but have been. Okay, so if you ever went to main road, you could have fucking spun around in a circle with a blindfold on, just picked a seat, and still stood up and sang a song, and people would have joined in with you. 
Yeah. So absolutely. Dinosaurs. At Tank Castle, it's getting to the stage where it's um, don't stand up. So when can we stand up? If they score, you've got about 30 seconds to stand up, celebrate, <laughs> sit back down, you know, and it's like, don't clap. Yeah, you know, you've got to scare the birds. You're like, oh, fuck off. Can't just <laughs> let me support my team. Well, where, you know? where, me and Rob are, where me and Rob are in the South Stand, at the start of every season, uh, it's show sick who I don't get on with, the, uh, the private security yeah, force. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They... Um, at the start of every season, they make a concerted effort to get us all to sit down. It lasts for half a game, half a game and then they give up. Give up. We, 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 I've never sat down at the Etihad, no. not once, and we sing for 90 minutes. That's them that are going to protect you when you go and get your away tickets, isn't it? <sighs> yeah, no, it's, uh, I think a lot of that game... Show sec. Like now, after every match, me and Rob get a bus. What is it, the 136? What, what bus is it? One, 216. 216. We get the 216 back into town after every match. Yeah. Now, it's a bus... Uh, for most of your life, you're able to get on a bus without assistance, right? Unless you need a wheelchair or whatever. For some reason, the last couple of years, um, Showsec have decided that they now need to kettle us onto buses like fucking farm animals for the slaughter, which makes getting on the bus out of the ground take 45 minutes longer than it should do. Yeah. So that's nice. They didn't even count past 10 now. They had your counting one. Yeah, so. yeah they stand there <laughs> counting. If it wasn't... If it wasn't for the council, we'd be able to get in and out the stadium a lot easier, and that just makes it ten times worse, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, sanitization of the product. They they know better. <laughs> mm-hmm. than me. Yep. Right. You're so, just a fan, mate. Just a fan. Are you allowed yeah. to be one of them anymore? I'm not sure. License. <laughs> I, I've made the point many times. Look, there's there's a Chinese guy or or, a, or an Indian guy or a guy from Africa or a guy from America or a guy from South America that'll go to the Etihad once a season and he'll have fucking 18 other friends that'll do it on different days, spend spend 250 quid in the club shop, buy a fucking pie and a pint, go and enjoy City Square, and they'll spend much more money on City than I ever will. That's happened last year. Last, there was one game last season. I had one guy next to me in the South Stand, and he was there, and he was there with his phone, every opportunity, taking photographs, filming it. We were all singing. His film was all singing. And it's like, have you ever been before? He went, no, I've seen it on TV. But he walked away from there with the biggest smiles I've ever seen. Well, good luck to him. And that was it. I think that's what you But just as you know, that in 10 years' time, the stadium will be full of fans just filming each other. We'll give them yeah. a stand. <laughs> give them a stand. They'll play a night. fucking CD. <laughs> They'll play a CD of someone singing. We've had that before, at, remember? At the, <laughs> at the match, I mentioned the Bristol City match, a cup game, um, Carabao Cup. Um, I'd done it myself, you know. I spent an absolute fortune, but as I said, don't get the chance to get down as much as I would like. And I'd got a couple of retro strips. I think I got the the um, is it purple and yellow brother top, and I got the red and black um, retro, really thick away, um, like the AC Milan style strip. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> that that strip strip for some reason is so so thick I, I wouldn't like to think they used to play with these strips on <laughs> but um yeah I, I came down and spent an absolute fortune eh? but there's there's so many different bits that are actually made for people to go and get their pictures taken at you know it's like they actually build statues of Bell and all that so you can actually go and give them a cuddle and you know a polo shirt and that's it <laughs> well I told you we're just dinosaurs mate Especially me. I don't go to the shop. You do. I don't. The way we talk about Manchester City sometimes. I mean, I, I've known Rob a while now, and we, we go we go games together and all the rest of it. But the way we talk about City, it's almost as if we fucking hate it. But it's our but, thing to hate. <laughs> <laughs> it's at least you're still getting passionate about your team, though. Yeah? Oh, no, no, I'll never die, mate. No. Exactly. Bar you know, get, it's the only thing they'll story, never take. Yeah. Well, my son's not got. My son's got my choice. <laughs> um, right. So. I think we can come back onto this issue in a little bit. And in a little bit also, I'm going to ask you guys about your tenuous or tenuous connections to Manchester City, your 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 fan watching history and all the rest of it. But I want to bring up some issues that have been in the media recently. So the first one is the BBC strikes again. Remember that remember that impartial um impartial broadcasting service that we're all supposed to pay for with our license fees and all the rest of it. They're supposed to represent everybody. They they employ this guy called Dan Rowan and he's a Recently, he interviewed the head of the Premier League, a guy called Richard Masters, and one of his one of his pressing questions was, "Are the Premier League going to do anything to address Manchester City's domestic dominance?" Now, I just want to, I just want to, I know, I know you just, I know you there, you want to bite me head off on this one, 
But I just want to let you know, since 1992 and the pr- formation of the Premier League, Manchester United have won the title 13 times. Chelsea have won it four times. Arsenal three times. City have won it four times. And Blackburn, Blackburn and Leicester have won it one respectively. Now, why why was Dan Rowan or somebody else not asking this question in the mid to late 90s or the mid 2000s? As I've just said, United have won the title 13 times. Why why now? Why now in 2019 uh, are this impartial broadcasting service, the BBC, posing the question to the Premier League, are you going to do anything to address, Man- address Manchester City's dominance? Why? Because they're not racist. <laughs> <laughs> the obvious answer is because we are Man, Man City. It's, it's so, so blatant from everywhere in the world how prejudiced things are. You know, it's it's not just them. It's ridiculous. It really is. But this is the BBC. I got my horse back. But the one that just... Oh, no, the well, sorry. I wasn't meaning them. <laughs> it meant everybody else. Well, the BBC, from those days, just over the road, well, just over the canal. Yeah. So it's the ship canal away from the swamp. Um, I can get so on my horse about this one. The fact that we're funded by oil money. Um, well, that's a quote one various term that does tend to do the rounds that's been in the press recently. The fact that our owners have human rights violations. Do they? D- direct. Can, oh. can, well, the thing oh, is, okay, no, all right, all right, it's in the press there, but it must be true. <laughs> in, in the last two seasons, in the last two seasons, because I want to play the Net Spend Champions game, in the last two seasons, I think our, our bill for outlay on players has been 60 million. Yeah. That's less than mid table clubs. But why right. let the truth get away with good stuff? Our wages, our wages, I think we're about the sixth or seventh highest wage payer. So there are, there are, there are six or seven teams ahead of us who pay higher wages. Sorry, mate. If you've got. Every single one of the journalists that you're you're talking about, and we all know who they are, right? And you say, right, give me 20 to 100 topics of what we could put out as a stat about Manchester City. Every single one of them would be negative, and that would be nowhere in their mind to come out with that stat. Why, why would they possibly want to come out with something that is going to make us look anywhere like a decent bunch of people, fans, you know, the 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 stuff that we get piled in with is ridiculous. It really is. It's so bad, you know. I mean, it, is it like them that aren't even in Manchester, right? Man City have united Manchester. Man United have split it into hundreds of bits from the outside. And as far as I'm concerned, you've got silly people like the BBC being anti City when City have done more for the city than Man United have ever done and they started off and still do get money from people that if we got associated we would get slaughtered. You know, it's just it's such double standards, it really is. Well you look at I mean I don't know how often you travel down to the city of Manchester, but uh, last time I was there, I've said this to you before, Rob, last time I was there, I counted 54 cranes. Mm. Now, I don't know if people remember, but in 2008 and 2009, <laughs> there was a global financial collapse. Yep. And all of the fucking grandiose plans that the, 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 the English councils had for their cities, Manchester being included on that, were thrown out the fucking window. Yeah. And it just so happens that Manchester, as a city, managed to be the, one of the, the few cities that said no to that. There's a big fucking reason for that. It's called Sheikh Mansour. Is this the investment? MCG. In, um, this is the, if I'm not mistaken, this is the fact that I'm quite, in fact, I've, re- I've reviewed here, and Rob, you know some of my reviews that I've done. Um, the fact that the, if I'm right, the Manchester City Council had a £2.6 billion European social fund loan cancelled and pulled, was it three weeks before the start of construction work? Next thing you know, Manchester City Council have got their 2.6 money, interest-free, Pay it back whenever you're ready, and that's come from part of the Arba Abu Dhabi Investment Fund. That's correct, yeah. And that's if you think about it, that's actually an interest-free loan, two point six billion, that hasn't been publicised because the way that our owners work is we'll just go under the radar and we'll just get it done. Yeah, I mean, that's if you're if you're a real Mancunian, regardless of which side you, you support, whether you're red or blue, the actual difference that that, that they've made in the in the city of Manchester, you can't argue with, yeah. and I. I but where, where, where are the daily BBC articles about this sort of stuff? I don't Just one. Owners, one or two. Our owners don't. If you look at the way I was saying, if you look at... No, Abu even Dhabi's if it's not the owners, surely the, surely the job of a fucking good journalist is to just... Uh, you know these as, as facts. They want to write down. Mm-hmm. They just want to write down, and I'm going to use my the phrase I hate the most. They just want clickbait. Well, it is all clickbait. And I've made, the, I've made the point the before. Jer- Jeremy Kyle, that's Jerry Springer, Trisha, Kilroy... 
didn't have fucking normal people as guests for a reason. Well, that's a but the problem shit. is, the, one of the biggest problems is, as a club, we're actually pretty fucking normal. Our owners aren't fucking spazzes. They don't yeah. do stupid shit. They don't go around fucking with gold AKs murdering people. They don't make bad investment decisions like they the American the owners of certain clubs. They don't levy debt against the club. They don't. They don't pay Neymar five hundred grand a week or buy buy Mbappe for fucking five hundred million pounds. They don't do any of these crazy things. They buy. I mean, like Bernardo Silva when he was playing at Monaco. We remember the Champions League games from yeah. Monaco, the, the two legs that we lost. Mm-hmm. Bernardo Silva was a decent player in that. Yeah. We we spent forty three million on him. I think Th- these are astute, real business people, and yeah. that is that that is the problem that, that all of these people have that aren't Manchester City. The fact that we're doing it so right and yeah, so listen. well, they can't compare. I mean, Manchester United had, pre- had Premier League dominance, like I said, 13 titles in 20 years of the Premier League or whatever, nearly 20 years of the Premier League, um, and 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 didn't do any of the things that we've done. But then again, you've got that. You've got the. They didn't do any of the things. Manchester United could have quite easily, before the Glazers levied the debt and all the rest of it, could have quite easily built infrastructure. Could have quite easily turned their stadium from a fucking broken pile of Meccano into an actual Mm -hmm. stadium. Built youth facilities, built youth squads, built all these investment opportunities for the city of Manchester. They did fucking none of it. Shareholders want their money. They did fucking none of it, and that is the wrong way of going about it. We're going about it the right fucking way of going about it, yet we're the ones that are the fucking because criminals. Because go, it's going against the status quo. The status yeah. quo says you have to do it a certain way. You have to do it the Trafford Rangers way. That's the way you have to do it because that's the way it's been done before. I mean, Nothing what have, new, what have Liverpool fear. what have Liverpool Football Club actually done for the city of Liverpool? What have the, what have the fucking Fenway Group done for the city to of Liverpool? Copyright the name. Oh wow, fucking amazing! <laughs> you tried to copyright the name Liverpool. They've just oh, they've just got a media machine. If that's the best way I can really describe it. So, so, so you, you the, one of the first things you said there, Rob, was racism. Now, what colour uh, skin do the uh, the Glazers have? So I thought they had a nice, good old-fashioned white rednecks. Uh, what about the the Fenway Group, Gillette, and all the rest of them? Ditto. Okay, and what about Sheikh Mansour? Suntanned. Oh, <laughs> that was political. So you've correct. got two examples yes. of bad business models there, and one example of a good business model. I think the racism there for me isn't just about. Uh, it's not a skin tone. It's a. It's a whole political. Racism, it's the whole agenda thing in the, the haves, the ideology, the haves. But what, the what ideology is Sheikh Mansour impressed upon Manchester City other than we want to win at football? He's impressed, he's imp- all he's done here is has said, he made me become a Muslim to watch Manchester City. Go back to the very beginning, right at the very beginning when the takeover first happened. Can you remember the very first statements that were coming out? Uh, Camera's name now, the guy was there who suddenly vanished very quickly. Um, Gary Cook. No, when they first brought the club. Uh, I can't remember his name. That anyway, uh, there was a, anyway he came out with the early statements that we're going to buy Ronaldo, we're going to buy X, Y, and Z. Anyway, Gary Cook, weren't it? The, kid, the car, <laughs> car, and the fucking all that uh, shit. No, not the Ford car. No, um, he came out and said that the only thing these guys want to do, and they were very blunt at the beginning, was we're buying Manchester City Football Club tomorrow, Abu Dhabi. There was no secret about that. And if you ask any of the fans at the time, there was no secret. That's what we're here to do, and to do that, we have to be the best. And if you look at the board, as you say now, that we've got now, they've delivered on what they said. We want to be the best. We have. Okay, we know this model works in terms of success and association with success. Look at our sponsors now at the moment. We've got sponsors, as we know, knocking the door to join in. You know, we've got, you know, we look at, look at the labels. We've got banging on the doors now. Look at the bottom of the team sheets and programs. You can see them all listed there now. I'm the days when we were looking to our various pies on the bottom of the sheets. But the same thing applies in that. Success is there. That's what people are fearful of. And it's that whole, I'm using the word racist because people fear that as a concept. The fact that we've come out and we're going to be the best. The fact is, I'm not Eric who sold dodgy meat when I bought the club. Yeah, And we all know which what I'm referring to there. And if, we, if we're comparing the two there, we've come in, we've delivered. We know it works now. Let's repeat that model worldwide. Now, that is what's scaring people. Okay, we're here. I'm, we're Manchester City fans. We can see what's happened at our club. Now we've got this little thing called CFG, who are now rolling out worldwide. And I've, I've read it. I'm not sure where, where I read it, who wrote it. If we compare that now, what City are building, and you can see what the transfers we're doing. We're not building Manchester City now. We're building City, full stop. We're building a new entity. It's not going to be the model. It's the model, I believe, that they want to, uh, Seriano wants to put in place and bring Barcelona. things at Barcelona. And they weren't allowed to yeah. because the Barcelona shareholding model said, no, 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 it's for us, the Catalonian people only. They've come over here and we've said, yeah, go on, have your fill. And now we're seeing fruition of it. And now Barcelona will see people at the top table saying, excuse me, who are these upstarts? 
we don't like this anymore. And and that's a fear. And it is a fear of the unknown because of what we have. And I think and that, that is the race, racist and as you know, we all know, racist ideology, anything of that nature. It's a fear of the unknown, what you don't understand. And what do you do with them you don't understand? You attack it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's a huge... well, The thing is, though, I mean, I'm going to come to you in a second, Craig, but one thing yeah. that I have to say is I believe in osmosis with the idea that if you impart your ways on a culture, yeah. regardless of whether you want to or not, you're going to take something back. Yeah. You look at all modern societies that are influenced by everything that came before it. So even if Shape Man saw and all the rest of it did want to impart ideologies upon our culture or, 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 or make, get us thinking in a certain way or not. No matter how much he or, or he does not not want City to influence him or the people of Manchester to influence him. And pe- you know, look at the changes that have actually gone in that region of the world in the last five or six years. You know, like people, things like women drivers and stuff like that. I mean, that, that is a stupid issue in the first place. And if Shane Mansour was behind that, then I'm against you for saying that, Shane Mansour. You know, or, or homosexual people or, or whatever people's beliefs are around the world. The world is a constantly evolving place. And, and levying accusations at those people who own our clubs saying that you are this model because in the past people from your culture yeah. have done this or whatever. It's absolutely absurd and insane. And I totally get you. The fear of the unknown drives racism. And, and there's more going on there than just racism. It's, it's, it's more institutional than that, although it is a big part. But the fear of the unknown drives a lot, of the, a lot of the motivation from these people. But all of these clubs, all of these big European powerhouses like United, like Liverpool, like Barcelona, like Real Madrid, like Bayern Munich. Bayern Munich are the biggest, the biggest offenders for this sort of stuff. They've had their chance over the decades to do things the right way. And because they haven't done it, that is why there is so much rhetoric and hatred and bile towards Manchester City now. I actually totally agree. I think um, it, it kind of all boils down to why why we were hated in the very first place and that is exactly what Rob was saying about the unknown and I think with, with how well we've done and how how easily the, the business plan has taken effect, I'm not saying it was easy but I'm just saying how quickly it's taken effect and how well it's doing, I think the people that started the hatred in the first place were the FFP and the people that didn't want anything new rising and we've done it in what I think is an ethical way I think Mansoor I think any of them there's there's not been any pushing of anything on our club that we don't want in terms of their, their culture or anything like that I think they've done everything with the utmost respect and I don't think there's anybody out there that if they've seen the numbers and they've seen exactly what they've done for the city and everything wouldn't say they've not done a good job but it started with the ffp and everything and it's the fear of the unknown and i totally agree with you Rob. so you look at other stuff as well i mean i just had to google it then for the exact year but alex ferguson took over united in 1986 as manager yeah. they didn't win their first champions league until 1999 now you look at manchester city one of the biggest things levered against manchester city in recent years is mm. you've qualified for the champions league now but you've not won it. As far as being competitive and actually attempting to win the Champions League in our last eight eight years, is that a good? Is that a fair assessment to say that we've actually been competitive enough to be in the we've, Champions League for about eight been, years now? We've been more consistent in our first eight years than what United were. Well, yeah, yeah, but but it's about eight years now we've actually been trying for it. Yeah. Now in 2014 we got to the semi final, although quite a few journalists like to admit that a couple of years ago when they were saying City never got past the quarters. <laughs> Uh, and then we've had a couple of quarterfinals and a couple of last 16s. Yeah. In eight years, we've not won it yet. Yeah, we know we've not won it yet. We won a European competition in 1970, but apparently that's an irrelevant European competition. Oh, okay. I don't personally believe in European dominance as the way to be the biggest club in the world. I think, I don't, I, I, th- I find it hilarious that people who don't win trophies can actually be considered for the Champions League. I mean, mm-hmm. the very name of the competition yeah. is Champions. I think that if you, I mean, Liverpool won the Champions League against Tottenham this this season, just gone. Uh, with, I think the 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 Tottenham game against Ajax was quite an exciting two leg affair. I yeah. think the Barcelona mm-hmm. versus Liverpool was quite an exciting two leg affair, mm-hmm. and I think the Tottenham versus City was a quite exciting second leg. Especially the first leg was 
was exciting if you're a Tottenham fan, new ground yeah. and they yeah. wear all missed penalties and stuff like that. But those five games were probably really good. The final itself was was horrendous. I mean, yeah. if you had to judge a product on, on a final, then that was absolutely horrendous. Anyway, so we've been at it for about eight years competitively. It took Sir Alex from 1986 to 1999 to win it. So I'm not worried. I, I, I do think that it is coming Maybe this year, maybe not. I, I don't know, but I don't get as stressed out as some people get stressed out about Champions League and winning the Champions League. I mean, Liverpool, for example, Liverpool last season, uh, if it wasn't for a Mara's missed penalty, uh, we would have taken six points off them last season. Yeah. So how can you be the champions of Europe when you can't even be the champions of your own country? I don't get it personally. But anyway, what do, what do you guys think about City's roadmap for the Champions League and what what sort of weight do you put in the Champions League anyway? You can you can tell me I'm totally wrong. You can say Rob City are nothing until they won, until they won the Champions League. You can tell me that. I'm, nah. I'm fine with that as long as you give me reason and back it up. No, nah, I think you always have to concentrate on your your bread and butter, and the Premier League is the most important. And I don't care what anybody says. Yeah, we maybe have to win the Champions League in the next couple of years. Maybe we do. I don't know, but I think you concentrate on. Your your actual your your league. That's what I think everybody's plan has to be every year, and anything on top of that has to be a bonus. And the, I'd, I've made this comment before, Rob, and I don't know if you read it when we been speaking, Mandy. Um, that there's no day for for remember that um, Ferguson when he probably had his best team and they were going through their best time took his team out the, one of the Cups and FA, said yeah. that they weren't playing well, in that Cup that season FA Cup, because... Well, just to interrupt you, just to interrupt you a second. Sorry. Jürgen Klopp last season threw, threw away the League Cup and the FA Cup yeah. as soon as he could. Mm-hmm. He is this season as well, apparently. Oh, he's doing it again this season, apparently. apparently. Now, when, when, when Pelle, just to throw this out there, by the way, guys, when Pellegrini in 14 played half a youth team at Chelsea, Chelsea away. Mm-hmm. A thousand fucking articles were written within 24 yep. hours about how City disrespect the Cups and all the rest of it. I've not seen any of those articles for Liverpool or United over the years. Anyway, exactly. Greg, back to you, Paul. <laughs> no, as you're saying, that's, that's exactly right. I think the fact that, that nothing's been said about the Ferguson thing is, is such an important point because if we believe what we believe that what we done last season was just incredible then you have to remember that Ferguson thought the Champions League was more important than domestic, you know? So his rhetoric wasn't to win the treble and, and his, his bread and butter, was to go and win the Champions League, you know? And I, I think that's wrong. I really do. I think however successful he was and everything, I think the fact that we've just done that is, is down to his disregard for who it is that makes Man United what they became as as the the league itself and the FA Cup is such a big part of the Premier League you know I think it always has been always will be I think you're right I think for me the the thing when you're looking at the the Old Trafford team and etc of that nature is the fact that and the Champions League, Champions League now it's the image that it creates rather than what it actually is as it does an image thing the, the Champions European League Carabao by, Cup glorified yeah, top competition yeah. If yeah. you went to uh, if you went to majority, I'm saying majority here, of the the match going fans of the the older era, shall I say? I'm including myself in that one. Um, if you go through, okay, you got a choice. You can do domestic treble like you did last year, or quadruple if you prefer, or you can win the Champions League. I'm going to give you that straight choice. I don't think they're managed to take in the one trophy. I'd I'd rather win the Premier League. To, the, to sacrifice everything else but if we just yep. so happen I like the FA Cup and I like the League Cup and I'm, I'm okay with the Champions League um, before City were even in the Champions League when we were still just City City not actual fucking Super City I might have watched the final of the Champions League I, I really didn't care about. I, I think ITV might have had it in the late in the early 2000s didn't they well. and it'd be United on every fucking time I'd watched a couple of them but the Champions League it was okay as a cup competition you've hit yourself there though you say now it, it was okay if you look at it now the way, the way it yeah, is even with City in it now, it's still only it's okay. Work. I go and watch City in the Champions League going away like you, Rob, and it's still only okay. Yeah, it's not it's where... It's not fucking great. It's not a priority to me. The priority, uh, to quote Craig as well, I think hopefully I'll find the same. It's your bread and butter is your league. End. It has to be. I mean, I that bet you've got you better are. memories of going fucking watching City versus Shallow Eye, and I've got better memories of watching City versus fucking TNS than yeah. you have of any Champions yeah. League game. Yeah, watching City where, yeah. 
the thing is, so it, what's that all about? That's all irrelevant, though, really, because it was a, a Mickey Mouse Cup, is it not? <laughs> that's it. I think, I think for me, it is. It is very much down to the. I'm going to use the phrase the stick to beat, as we touched on earlier. Yeah, but this is the other thing as well. If that's we go and is. win the fucking Champions League this season, let's say that we win, we could now go in our group of the Champions League, win every game, ten fucking nil. All the way to the final, 10-0 the final. Dope City have doped the sport. City have ruined the fucking yeah. sport. Nice. City have spent all this money on the sport. It's not. It's an undeserved Champions League trophy because they just fucking spent more than anyone else. And then the last thing that would be levied at us after all of those things would be, ah, but you've only won fucking one. So what's right. the point anyway? Exactly. What's the fucking point anyway? Is this the, is this the alleged rumour for the Super League that we were apparently in conversation with? Yeah. Where we, uh, we were involved in the, the conversations with other clubs unofficially. But this is, Rob, that's, what, that's why I'm going back to the 1970 fucking yeah. Cup Winners' Cup that we won. That was the format that it existed in back then, so that's how we fucking mm-hmm. won it back then. But this is the package product you're talking about now that so we mentioned earlier. if you change sport entirely and have a European Super League, a Liverpool and United and us and anyone else who's won the Premier League, the FA Cup or the League Cup still going to be saying, oh, we've won all these titles because it'll all be irrelevant when football evolves again. Yeah, you have a Champions, so what Champions does it League fucking team. mean in the first place? Football is all, in my opinion, no matter how much history Rangers have got or City's got or fucking anyone's fucking got, the only thing that matters is the here and fucking now. I agree. Yeah. I've said that before, as you yeah. know. It's, I, I think one well, of the conversations we've had previously has been, and you mentioned today, touched on is, it's a st- It's like a stone. Football is a stone. It rolls. It comes downhill. Yeah. It always changes. It always evolves. Because if you brought, if you could somehow teleport that Manchester United team of 1999 to now... They'd get knocked out of the fucking cup in the first fucking round and yep. they'd get their ass kicked isn't it? Because football was a different fucking sport back then. Yeah. Totally it's different, isn't it? It's completely different. You've got, you know, we're not just talking about, you look at the, the players themselves, look at the physical players, look at the differences in the players. Physicality's changed. The game then of having your big man up top, you know, give it to Gordon for now, that's all gone. Give it to Gordon. <laughs> yeah, that's that's all gone now. It's, a, it's more technical, more skillful. The biggest compliment I can give this City side that we're seeing now which is the best I've ever seen in my life. You look at the, you look at some of the games over the weekend, any weekend of the Premier League season. You watch how many teams now are trying to play out from the back. That's yeah, flattering. That's how football should be played. Let's but, be honest. Exactly. Let's be honest. How many times previously have we seen the ball in defence? How many times did, did we rob prior to the Guardiola time? See us get the ball back and say lump it forward to the man up top. We've right, seen it. Even, even from when you were a kid, Rob, yeah. and when you were young, especially when you were young, because you didn't have the physical ability to boot the ball down the field. Yeah. The way you played football was close, short passing. Yeah. Five aside football, seven aside football. That's how you play football. Yeah. So for some reason, so when you're a kid as an amateur or whatever, and everyone who starts playing football as a kid plays football by short yeah. passing because that's what you're limited so in that's... ability to be able to do. Now it turns out that the upper echelons of football, the best way to play it is that same short, short, short passing instead of fucking lumping it. So maybe, maybe for some reason, football was distorted for two decades by teams that have won the league, like the Mourinho team in the mid two thousands yep. with Chelsea, where you fucking lump it to the big man, or the United team where you'd lump it to the big man. Sure, those teams did that did have elements of skill in them, but they're the ones that distorted how football should be played. If you look at City in the late sixties, they did actually pass it, not not as much at the fucking back like that. But they still did p- play the ball around with short, sharp passing. You look at the the the, um, the Barcelona team in the nineties, yeah. short, sharp passing. You look at the Dutch team in the seventies and eighties, short, sharp passing. German team, short, sharp passing. Still had the big man up front, mm. but they could still fucking pass the ball. So it's not us that have fucking distorted football in philosophies and how to play football. We've actually just returned football to how it should be played. It should be. And then um, again, look at the look at some of the games you'll see now. Um, we've seen it in some of the pre-season games already. And we saw it in that game at Lambda Charity Shield game. If you look at that one, there seemed to be one tactic to play against us. They try and float it over the top and get into the corners. That seems to be the only tactic I've seen so far from anybody at the moment. Let's put it into the corners and turn it around. Or the back post. When Pep Guardiola first came into City and got rid of Joe Hart, right? I know Joe Hart's got his fucking critics, but for years and years, Joe Hart was probably the best goalkeeper I've ever seen at City, ever, with his shot stopping ability. But that's not why Pep got rid of him. He got rid of him because he couldn't fucking his distribution was piss poor because he wasn't playing football properly. Yeah. And I'm sorry, Joe Hart, you were a great fucking goalkeeper, yeah. but you weren't a great footballer. Yeah. And, that's and he was a footballer before he was a keeper. Yeah, and a cricketer. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you understand what I'm saying, though, right? I mean, like, yeah. this entire brand of football that we've we've come now, it, it needed new, a new name for it, really. I remember uh, I went to see. Um, Barcelona at Murrayfield. Um, really, really, really good game, right? But if you maybe 
see Man City when Pep first came in and never had the drilled in, in their positions properly and thinking his mentality. Um, maybe just shades of that, but very bloody good football. I watched Pep's Barcelona and they were, they were Ronaldinho and all that. I mean, they were superb. But the, the, it was the same kind of football, just not as good as we play it now, you know? So, I mean, he's obviously evolved and stuff, but the way he is playing these football over here, it's like he's been trying to do that for a long, long time, you know? Yeah, speaking learning. speaking of Pep Guardiola evolution, I'm going to say something now that you can, and, and anyone who listens to this podcast, can quite easily try and shoot me down over. Lionel Messi would not get into a modern Pep Guardiola team. Agreed. He may uh, he may have been an integral part of the Pep Guardiola's initial team. Yeah. But people ask me all the time, why do City players get so many injuries? And people comment, why do City players get so many injuries? The reason is, there are three things that you need to be at Manchester City. You need to be a world-class athlete. You need to give everything you've got in the 90 minutes. You can't give 60%, 70%, 80%. You can't rest on your laurels. You have to fucking run yourself into the ground. And then thirdly, after being a world-class athlete and somebody who is willing to kill yourself for the shirt, you have to be a world-class footballer. Yep. Now, Lionel Messi is one of those things. I don't think he's a world-class athlete. Ronaldo was a world-class athlete physically. Mm. Messi's not a world-class athlete. He will not run himself into the ground for that Barcelona team. No. But he is a world-class footballer. Yeah. So you talked about Pep, Pep Guardiola's constant evolution there, mm -hmm. which is why no matter how good people say Lionel Messi is, and he might be that good, he wouldn't get into the modern Manchester City team because he does not have the work rate. If you think about the Manchester City team that Pep had already envisaged, envisaged coming into this this setup, right, was with Gabriel Jesus as his yeah. front man. You are only just now seeing him yes. evolving enough to maybe, as you've seen at, at the weekend, you maybe see Gabriel Jesus getting the. the game start and Aguero being on the bench and I totally agree because it is evolving and it is him evolving with it and he's getting better and better and it, it, it is I don't, it, I, I don't think Messi would get in the team but what I totally do believe is that his, his initial Gabriel Jesus and I know I know Aguero pulled it round and he is one of my all time favourite Man City players he really is I love up my bits but it's it's time for him to evolve from having that wee short guy that can finish in the middle of the box to having another athlete that can sprint through there. And he did up his game. He upped his game by about 20-30% and he's, he's running and stuff. But he just is not what Pep's looking for now. You know, he's he's done his job and he's done it bloody well, but it's not it's not it's not the uh, the way Pep's going, and that just, is Gabriel Jesus. Sorry. Just just before Rob comes back at me on this, I can't believe that I actually didn't get any resistance on the on the Messi thing. Sorry, every yes. single time, yeah. every single time I call Messi out because he's always <laughs> in the Ballon d'Or contention and all the rest of it. And I, I do think he is a, a world class footballer. He's got a Bell great touch. On. Yeah, the Bell end door. Yeah. <laughs> but every single time I say that Messi's not that good because I don't think he is that good because he doesn't offer the other two categories that I said are a must to be a City player now, which is world-class athlete and the ability to, the, the desire to run yourself into the ground. And everyone always gives me so much shit for saying that. But you two, I, I don't know, you. this is the first time I've met you, Craig. You actually yeah. agree and you've actually given me points as to why you agree. And Rob agrees as well. I don't know whether Rob's son would agree, but... Well, are you gonna, my question is, who are you going to drop to put Messi in there? Yeah, nobody. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, that's, that's I'd, I'd my rather have a fucking 11 Bernardo <laughs> Silvers than 11 Messis. Yeah. Well, mm. you're going, back, going back to your point there about, about Messi and the athletes, etc. Listening to the interviews and the end-of-season interviews that Pep's done, one of the prime reasons he went out and bought Mendy wasn't for his defence. That he was attacking capabilities. We could have changed. He could have Gabby Jesus going through the middle. That was one of the reasons he bought him. Yeah. He bought Mendy. So if we look at that now and you look at the way it's evolved, going back to Sergio, I think for me the big thing we've seen from Sergio is he woke up one morning had a hell of a culture call. I've got Aye. to change my game. Because mm. let's be honest, the first season Pep was here, I think Rob knows my opinion, Sergio was gone. Yeah, he, was. he wasn't. Yeah. He wasn't a pep player, and like Rob said, then every you look at every player in that in in the city squad now, primarily they're athletes. You look at the science team we have behind that squad now. Yeah, it's immense. You see them laugh about it every time of the game, and the, the sky reports actually get hold of it. Whoa, look how many people in the back room. 
yeah, but that's why we've got lots of these silver pots coming to the club now because we're doing it that way. And it's a case of if you look at Aguero when he that in that first season, and you know we'll look at the Gabby Jesus scenario and land down and say Mendy. It was a case of to Sergio Aguero, yeah, you're a great striker. Thank you very much for everything you did in the you no know, in that game, but you have to change. And the bottom line is, if you don't change, I've got somebody who'll do it for me. That's what I want you to do. I think he would have went as quickly as hot. Sorry. That do. Mm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I think that if we look at the game now, but he, but he, but he manned up though. Like, yeah, can't deny he did. Up. And oh, he changed. Uh, Shabby Jesus yeah. is certainly the future. I mean, that, that first goal against West Ham away, mm. that touch and that run. Yeah. You're not the Brazilian striker for no reason. Let's be blunt. Well, yeah. remember, remember to get the, the 100 points he had to score that wee goal that he took yeah. down and put it past the keeper with a plong and everybody said he was a tapping special. The first dinky you know? dinky. <laughs> so we've covered the uh, the Lionel Messi agenda. Now I want to I want to talk now about one player which I don't see as a, ple- play, a pep player but still has just recently signed oh, here we go. Oh. a contract <laughs> until 2023. Now, and do you know what? Do you know I, what? See what you were saying about being an athlete? That's exactly what's wrong with him. He's, he's not got the middle part, which was what you said, the 110% giving it for the shot. He is so scared of getting injured again. I know you're talking about Shawnee. <laughs> so, yeah, we all, we all think we all know. But the thing is, and I, I need the caveat to all of this is, I need to say beforehand, I think that he is a great footballer. Yeah. I don't hate him. I don't dislike him. And I'll support anyone who ever pulls on a City shirt. He was brilliant. Uh, but he did get injured. And I think Jak- yep. was it Jakob West Brom or something? Oh, Jakob did it. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, so Ilkay Gundogan, I think, is a fantastic footballer. Just signed a contract until 2023. But I think this is not the team for him. I think it's evolving now, and I think that's what you see. I think if we look at the, the squad as it is now, obviously, we've the signs have come in. We've got Rodri for the Ferner role. And I'm wondering now, he's got the extension in. Is this extension now just going to be the potential of backup for Rodri? Well, it, I made I nearly made a video. I nearly made a video after the uh, after the Community Shield of Ilkay Gundogan highlights because every time he got the ball, it went out for a throw in. I'm, I'm not joking. I think for me, Gun, he's got a, he's got a role in the squad. I don't think he's a bad player, and I think for me, it's. I know we've said before about athletes, etc. Is his thing for him the fact that he may not be the most dynamic athlete, but you know he will give you everything he's got. He may not be winning at you know the same speed as but he will start yeah. the same game. He will start the game and finish it at the same rate. Well, his range it might of be stop looking great. at His range of but... passing is great, and his football and ability is great. It's just five yards slower than the rest of the team, yeah, and, it, and that really shows when you when you put Gundogan in the same team as Fernandinho or mm-hmm. Gundogan in the same team as Rodri. The second half against Liverpool at Wembley is a, is a, is an example of that. The team just isn't the same fucking team. Is it that just isn't. cover? It's but... too slow. Yeah. So. And and I don't want to ba- I don't want to bash or berate a city player because it's not me, but it's one or the other. You can never play both of those in the same team unless you're really comfortable and already six 0 up. I think that's cover. I think for me, I'd say it's cover. Look, we mentioned them before about far planning, i.e., in terms of Mendy working with Gabby Jesus, etc. And the same thing, we know the fans have seen it for a long while. We've had an issue with the Fernandinho position. Is the best way I can describe it. Okay, we've got Rodri in. Looks like he'll do the job in a good way. He'll do an excellent job. Now then, my mindset is we've also then got Fernandinho potentially penciled in, as he said himself, to cover centre back. Mm-hmm. So that then gives us a bit of a potential issue in terms of if we have an injury at centre back and we have to move Fernandinho there, who's going to cover that? Is it purely a case of if Rodri's out, he's going to be sitting there as the Rodri cover while we then build somebody else into it, a Phil Foden, or maybe move somebody like a you know, De Bruyne about that. Is that a case of are we? For, is this part of our forward planning in that he's only here now in that holding role in case we need cover mm-hmm. to move forward? So let's be honest. He's first in the in this country for me. I think Roger will do the job without a show of doubt. I think he'll be a very yeah. very good asset for he us. He needs to he needs to quickly get up to but the pace. Of the I think for me that's the, the difference. We have that premier. if we have the games where we need it. Gundogan can give us that head. I said he may not be the quickest, but he can read the game. And I think f- my opinion is that. We've given the extension here. Okay, he was looking around in Europe for the options. He's come up and said that. But I think for me, it's a very wise move from us as a club because that then gives us the time to develop fully. And it shows how long Pep or the value Pep places on Fernandinho. It's going to take me this long to get somebody in to replace you to get to your level. And in that time, if it happens, I've got a backup I can just drop in place. 
Well, the strange. I mean, I, I'm going to come to you on this again in a minute, Craig. But the, yeah. one one thing I want to point out is, strangely, Pep's philosophy over the last two seasons seems to have been dictated somewhat by injuries. Now, yeah. before Mendy got injured, if you think back, Pep wanted to play three at the back with two wingers, with, with two wing halves or wing backs or whatever you want to call them. Bef- before Mendy got injured, then he had to revert to a back four uh, because Mendy got injured. Uh, and now my my thought before Sane got injured was that Pep is going to either bring Bernardo into the middle or just fucking completely go balls deep on Phil Foden um, and and still play three at the back. Now, my three at the back philosophy was um, Cancelo, who we've now signed as right wing back because he's not a defender in the slightest. Mendy, if he was fit, although still not fit, as an attacking left back uh, or... Angelino or Zinchenko. Zinchenko is such a quality fucking footballer. He would get into the midfield of any other fucking Premier League team. It's ridiculous. Anyway, and then he, I, then my thought was that he would play Walker for his pace at centre half to be the defensive cover on corners, free kicks, and stuff like that. Stones on the port as his primary centre centre back options. So that'd be a flat back three with two attacking mm-hmm. wingers. And then my other thought was if Sane was still fit, he would play. De Bruyne and Bernardo in the centre or De Bruyne and Foden in the centre with occasional cameos by David Silva, who's obviously ageing, and play a combination of either Sane and Sterling or Sane, Sterling, Mares, whatever, up top, or Sane, Gabby Jesus, or Sterling, Gabby Jesus, stuff, stuff like that. But I think those plans have now changed again as they did change in the 17-18 season. Because of injury, Mendy injured in that season. Mendy is still injured now, unfortunately. Although he should be coming back before the end of the month, I think, or the end of the next month. About five weeks, I guess. Six I, weeks. I got my ass shown to me yesterday. I got my ass shown to me with a West Ham away game because I did my t- pre pre match selections of, of what I thought the starting lineups would be, and I was told that Laporte was still out for a couple of weeks. But obviously, he played yesterday, so that was a it was one that I didn't get right. Um, but I think that Pep's team selections and formations. Everyone always says you never really know with a Pep team who's going to be in that starting eleven, and it is very interchangeable. But I do think that he's got an underlying philosophy that he still has yet not been allowed to implement because of injuries. So can I, can I make a couple of points here? Of course, you I can, Craig. think going quickly back to the the um, Gundogan thing. I think when he came in, he was like De Bruyne. He was like Sani. He came in, took the English game quite well, started getting on his feet and. I thought he was world class. I really, really did. And I just think after the injury, there's something that's not quite there with him. I don't know if it is him giving 110% and it's something else, or I'm not giving 110% because he's scared of getting injured. But as I said, I thought he was brilliant when he came in. I really did. I thought he was going to be amazing. But I'm not being hypercritical. I just don't think he's the player that he was when he came in. And I also think that Maybe it was something to do with not letting another midfielder who's too good go to Liverpool like we did with Milner. You know, I think if he had went to Liverpool, he probably would have made them a much better team. Okay. Um, I also think that, just to stick this in there, I think Liverpool could have stole a march on us this season. I think they're going to find Tottenham a lot more competition than what they were thinking. See if they had bought the light. David, so, even so, the other guy that top uh, uh, signed uh, with uh, Don Belly. I think yeah. Don Belly could be a, yeah. a revelation in the Premier League. He, he looked brilliant yesterday. But um, I see if Liverpool, are bo- I, I said to my son, I says, I, I, I put money on it that Liverpool will steal a march on us and buy the lit and have a solid back, you know. But it didn't even look like it crossed their mind, you know. Um, I thought they could have stole a match. They, they, they claim that have... they don't have the money to, to sign players, but yeah, their well, owners are sure loving that money that they're not spending on their own. Exactly, club. exactly. But the other thing that I was going to finish with is that um, what you were saying about the, the pet way of going forward and at the back and your team that you were picking, I had that in my head for a few weeks now as well since we're so strongly linked and gave um, the player we gave away, Daniel, was too good to give away plus that money oh, for somebody that I'm wasn't. Just, I'm just glad so, he didn't stay in the Premier League. Yeah, I really am see, glad he didn't stay in the Premier League. See if he had done what he wanted to do when he very first came in with the Mendy, the Walker and the back three, then that was his way of going forward, right? 
And I think so you're, you're on to that one as well because they've brought that point up before about Tim Tebow and other people have gone like, this. no, he didn't want to play like that. No, people have said, it. no, he didn't want to play that. But he really did want to he play. He did. That's on. why he spent all that money when he first came in on Walker, Mendy, Stones. You know, that's what he wanted. You know, and uh, with Vincent Company and Otto Mendy, I think he had these three centre backs. I think he would have played um, Mendy, Walker, and I think now he wants to play Mendy, Concello, and I think inside. I think you're going to see Stones on the right and I think you're going to see Laporte on the left and in the middle, I think you're totally spot on. It's either going to be Walker or Ferner. I really do think that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that was always my idea of how how, how Pep actually wanted to do things yeah. if he had an injury-free team. Yeah. But what I've mentioned in, in this in the past, even Andy has come back at me and said, no, that's not his philosophy. But yeah, it, it is, it is. Know, it is. And the thing is, that's what he spent 150 million quid on when he first came out. I know, like, that the Sannies and that were brought in before he was pretty much properly installed at the club. Was it Sani or was it... Oh, I can't remember who it was. There was some a couple of players that came in just before Pep came in that were Pep signings, and when he came in, I can't remember who it was. Was it? De- oh, do you know what? I so Sterling's one of them, definitely. De Bruyne. Yeah, one. yeah. I think it was De Bruyne and maybe Gundogan that were brought in that were just before Pep signed, and they were definitely Pep sign- uh, signings. You know. Um, yeah. Well, you can you can tell the difference because Mangala and. Welfred Bonnie were definitely uh, Pellegrini signings. Yes. Pellegrini's yes. philosophy. Yeah. So the whole thing was <laughs> when he came in, he spent 150 million on three players left back, right back, and centre back. And it didn't work, you know, because of injury and because of a dip in form of stones and stuff. It, it didn't work. And he had to go with something else. Now, well, I I just, just to come gets... in a second, sorry. Sorry. No, nothing against Pep Guardiola. Mm hmm. But if you would have given Jose Mourinho the the Zabaleta and Clichy in colour off, if you would have given him that in that sort of Chelsea philosophy that he had, yeah. he would have won the league with that team. I probably Mourinho would have. But but the but it would have been fucking boring one nils all season. Yeah, yeah. Pep Guardiola's philosophy, I'm sorry, you just have to fucking go with. And if he says I need this player. You've just got to fucking give him that player. He doesn't often say, say I need that player. And he certainly doesn't say, go out and get me Mbappe. You also fucking see me ass. Yes. <laughs> but you the know. thing is, if you remember that when his, his very first few games in charge, everybody was saying you can't play Mendy and Sani in the same team because they're both up there in the corner getting in each other's way. And it's like, that's how we wanted it for both sides, you know? Yeah, one hundred percent, and which is why I'd still say that we truly have not seen the Pep philosophy apart no, from in maybe no, five or ten properly. games over the last three seasons, yeah. because of injuries. Yeah, totally. You look at it yesterday, the, the, the Pep philosophy. Look at the the bar to see we had that was on the fly when he really had it. And you look at I'm looking at City and West Ham. Yeah, the the goal, the first goal was scored. Beautiful. If you watch watch that little ball, that's watch that ball that's played to Kyle Walker. Okay, he says Kyle Walker saying, well, crap, I've got competitions on the bench there now. But I'll tell you what, I've seen players at City and I've seen them go quick. I've seen them move. I've seen, I've seen David White shift when he, when he could. With respect, David, sorry. Um, I'll tell you what, I've never seen a player move that quick. No. He went around and was Cresswell. Was it, was it, yeah. He went Cresswell like he was standing still. Yeah. yeah? Well, he put a delivery in. How many say. times have we talked about Kyle Walker, though, not being able to put a delivery in? I think he's so much more than that fans was, than what we think he is. That he is, was he really amazing. Is. A lot of people have slagged Kyle Walker off, and I don't get it. Over yeah. the years at wow. City, we've had a lot of a lot of players on the wings. Like uh, I'll, I'll I'll give you two examples: Sean Wright Phillips and Jesus Navas. Uh-huh. That I've seen to have had pace in abundance. They look like they're on a different fucking planet compared to us running in gravity, right? But I'm sorry, they were shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's the point, yeah. Yeah, I, ju- I just think, I just think if you put him running through the middle for a solid event, defense, you're adding something that that's not even yeah, worth thinking absolutely. about yet. And you've got the two wide. Oh, it's just it is Pep's way, and the people that think no, but he's, he's played such a style for the last two years, mainly a four four two. Eh, oh, sorry, a, a four, four three four, three. Four three, yeah. uh-huh. a four, three, three is not Pep's way. That's not it his isn't. way. It's Does not. he have a style? Does he have a shape? He, he almost, he, we almost got it's to see like in the a... Liverpool 5-0 game. In the Liverpool yeah, 5-0 exactly. game, 
Danilo was playing through the fucking middle, mm-hmm. and that was almost as close to as Pep's if way was. They did. You the saw that against Brighton. I think it was the Brighton game where Danilo scored. I'm not sure. That last in the season before, and it was Danilo went straight through the middle. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I think it was Bernardo put him through. He went yeah. straight to the middle, tucked it in the bottom corner. And I think it was you had to turn around to him and went, that's our centre-back. That's an extra centre back. Right. This is going to make for a really what? boring podcast because I'm making these fucking points and you're actually agreeing with me. I'm used to people actually going, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong. I, I, know, I know in my heart of hearts I'm not fucking wrong about Lionel Messi well, being bang average and us not seeing Pep's Yeah, but it's a bigger so picture now, though. But, okay, then Pep's <laughs> philosophy but, then, Yeah. <laughs> Do they have in terms of philosophy then? Yeah, going back to you, you point out philosophy and style, etc., like that. Is one of the benefits we've then now got the fact that nobody knows fully what he wants to do? For example, the reason I'm saying that we clarify it is if you're the opposition manager, you have an idea in your head before the game that we're going to play pass and move, lots of touches, lots of passing, and try and get me out. You know that for a start. But you look at the squad at our disposal now. You haven't got a Scooby Doo. Which side we're going to go down? But that's left, sorry. right, centre. Are we going to mm-hmm. go, are we going to put a ball across the back? Are we going to drill it straight through? Mm-hmm. And I think that's the big thing. It's it's the case of we were talking about formations four three three four five ones etc. I'm going to put that out there. Does that really matter with the players we've got? Because at the end of the day, that's we're going to attack you whichever way we want. That's them. the thing with the, the forty four pass against Trafford last season. Mm. I'll know. I remember looking at you, Rob, after that goal, just turning around to you. Not even celebrating, just turning around to you and going, wow. wow. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't say anything more. And it's that that philosophy. You look at it. Our centre-backs at points of that, were, every player apart from Edison was in their half. Yeah. And all we were doing was moving the ball around. At that point in that game, we never had a shape. There wasn't a shape. It was right, there's the space, exploit the space. Double up on your players, do this, do... And that's my question I've said to you a few times, Rob, is... Do we actually have a set formation? Or do we have players who are better in certain areas, which dictates a formation? We have specialists, but those specialities just range fucking in a third of the pitch almost. You know what I mean? Like, for example, I'd trust John Stones on the ball, even though everyone gives him fucking criticism, Mm -hmm. for the first two-thirds of the pitch. Then when he's arrived at that point in the first two-thirds of the pitch, you've got fucking David Silva, Bernardo Silva, Leroy Sane, Raheem Sterling... Fucking, you know, Serge Phil Gavin, Foden, Sergio. You've got all of these players who were like, right, John Stone, Useful. you've done your fucking first two thirds. I'm going to show you how the last third's fucking done. And not only that, going back the other way, we've got special t- specialists like Rodri, Fernandinho, Dave Silva, all of these players that can just fucking take the piss in football. Now, I and go athletes. back, you go back, right, to the Mancini philosophy. Mancini, for as much as we fucking love him and for as much as I remember 11 12, was only ever going to win the league once with one with a one-way philosophy. Yeah. Pellegrini the same. Um, Mourinho at Chelsea in 2004, whatever. Mm-hmm. Ferguson. Ferguson won football with one philosophy. I could sit down with a fucking team of scientists for, um, for six years now and work try and work out Pep's philosophy. One, we haven't actually fucking seen it yet, in my opinion. And exactly. two, it's fucking fluid and it is willing to adapt and change. That's that's the thing. Football is fluid. It is always changing. It's always moving. It's always, all right, you've maybe not got your shape, but you know where everybody is. You're that intelligent. And I also think that the fact that he's not been able to play the five at the back the way he wants to and attack the way he wants to brings into what you said, Rob, as well, that there's not just going to be the fact of people saying, right, now we know what you're going to do. Now we know your formation. It's going to be the, oh, shit, he can now come down the left. He can cut inside. He can go down the left and cross. He can go down the right, cut inside, go down the right and cross. He's got so many people in the midfield that can create things and pass the ball. He's got a centre mid, a centre defence that can come all the way up and ping it in the top corner. You know what I mean? You're going to have so many points of attack that the defence of attacking and the attacking defence is just going to prove to be liquid. It's mm-hmm. just going to just... I, I just think you're going to see another step up from us that you've not seen already. Absolutely. There was an interview um, following that game with um, Sky's new correspondent, this certain Mourinho guy. I don't know if you've seen his interview, and he said... Has he got a call from Matt Alain? (laughs) He says, which four teams do you think could win the league? And he says, Manchester City, Tottenham, 
Liverpool and Man City B. <laughs> and if you, he's, he's actually that was his actual answer, Man City B. He said, if you look at the players they had on their bench, this is a on the game at West Ham. He said they would that would be any Premiership team starting eleven. Oh, if you would have had this current City team in the Leicester year or the Blackburn year or any of the fucking United years. <laughs> it would only be one winner. Yeah, and that I think that comes down to again echoing the point of a philosophy and the ability to change a game. If we look at if we look at it now, if we look at the games now, we look at the squad we've got. Okay, you're putting a five man defence out. You're playing a flat back five. We've seen it a million times. Fine, we'll keep knocking on the door. If we don't get through, fine, we'll change it. We'll bring on take you take the game with Sam. We'll bring on Bernardo Silva. Uh, we'll we'll. Move Mares inside, or we'll move phone out, or we'll get you a defense. I wonder how many panic, atta- panic attacks were had yesterday when Bernardo was on the bench. <laughs> <and Mara's side. laughs> but the principle of sound is that whole thing where yeah. Mares, by the way, this season is going to give you fucking a thousand percent more than he gave you last season. Just throwing it out there, he's well, not going to be allowed to not. Well, I think he's going to the... have to change shape a wee bit. I think. I don't know, yeah. actually. I think he's. I think Mares is going to give benefit from. The fluidity with his now, I think he's now decided yeah, to get used to yeah, the players. Yeah, just going to push him in a bit um, I think it's that thing where, I think when he came in at first, and I've said this to Rob a few times when we've been watching games here, I think he's been trying too hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he's been guilty well, of that. The weird thing is, you know he's... what one of the people, some people said to me last season, like, oh, you've got to give him time to settle in the Premiership, and like, no, he's used you know, to he, you know, he's Rio Mara's, right? He just literally <laughs> won it two years ago with fucking. Yeah, but I think Leicester. it's not a case of that. He was, you've said it yourself, Rob. He was re admired from Leicester. That was well, the, the case. Get a ball and give it to him. You need a fucking degree to work out the pet philosophy. No, but the thing is, you've got to remember the pet philosophy has came from, and and this is the thing that I totally believe that I don't think a lot of people think about. It's came from the Dutch from years ago through oh, yeah. Cruyff, Football. through through Barcelona, through Pep, and it's now only just Pep's philosophy on. All of that information that's been started years and years and years ago in Amsterdam, you know, and it's now just Pep's philosophy on other people's philosophies that has been going back for such a long time. And of course, the end result's going to be liquid. Of course, it is. Well, you, you know, know what? You know what? One of the weird things is, right? I've got my UA for B license in coaching football. Rob's got right. his level. What are you? Level one, level two in your coaching? Level two. Rob's level two in coaching football. Right. So. We, to a certain degree, could probably go out and manage Brentford or Oldham. Mm-hmm. I think we've got just, just about enough qualifications between <laughs> us. <It's great> right? <laughs> but when I watch football, right, when I watch a Pep team, when I watch the Mancini team or a Pellegrini team or a fucking Stuart Pearce team or a, a Mark Hughes team, I knew exactly what they were planning from the start and I knew what changes they were going to make and, and it was so predictable, right? And I'm not saying that I'm any more intelligent than any other any, any other average football fan. I'm not. Mm-hmm. I just have specific qualifications that I'll, I'll give me a little bit of inside track. Right. When I look at a Pep team and what, what and what Pep does during matches, I'm thinking Walker's having a good game here, or Stones is having a good game here. He's done this. He's done that. He's actually tried that. They probably obviously worked on that in training, and then five seconds later, he's over at the fucking sideline and Pep's fucking screaming down his ear, <laughs> and then he comes back on the pitch and does something incredible that we've never seen before. I could never coach that or manage that. I could yeah. never even see that to coach that or manage that. You've got to have lived that to know what the answers are. Is this the Pep Guardiola who, after winning, I think it was the FA Cup, was having a having one of those conversations with um, uh, Raheem Sterling? It's the same Pep Guardiola who did the same thing against Aguero, I think it was, when he put four or five past Leicester, I yeah, think it was. Yeah. The same Guardiola who did the same thing after West Ham game with Kevin De Bruyne about De Bruyne off. It's just the and level you know, of intensity it's, it's that's amazing. never existed yeah. before. And it's like inside his head, it's, he's not giving them a hard time. He's just so animated and telling them what they can do and what yeah. the next game they've got to improve on. But he has to get over at that point while it's fresh in his head. And, you know, he's just, he's, he, he has a different entity as a person. And you know and what the strange thing is? That, that entire philosophy permeates the entire club. Yeah. And, the weird, and the weird thing is people go to me, now, Touch wood, injuries with regards to Phil Foden. Hopefully, he never gets a fucking injury, yeah. right? Because we've been here before. We were here, we were here in the mid two thousands with um, Michael Johnson. Mm-hmm. We were here in the fucking eighties and nineties with Paul Lee. But Phil Foden with Pep at the fucking wheel, yeah, Pep at the wheel instead of all. He's not driving a bus. No, we've had that bus. If, 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 if yeah. Foden, I tell you what, if Foden doesn't win the Ballon d'Or within fucking five six years, I'll eat my own fucking shoes, because. 
the raw ability that that, that that kid has and the manager and the team behind him that he has, he really will be the best footballer. See, the, the thing is, you're going to eat your shoes, though, because I totally agree with you. <laughs> and where he's going, because you know the Bell and Dor is not going to be a City player in the next 10 years. Well, it's going to have to be a big... Uh, yeah. what, what does City have to win? Does City have to win the fucking World Cup? Or, or as I proposed the other day, does City have to be the first team to play in fucking space? You know, what, what, what's it going to take? I, 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 I would say we're <laughs> probably closer to space, yeah. <laughs> totally. I think for me, for me in terms of development, I think, again, look at the whole thing. We're picking up Foden at the moment. We've got, um, is it um, Howard? Yeah. Howard Howard Howard. We've, got, right. we've got Gar- still got Garcia. Um, we've got... Oh, there's the, a ton the of them. Don't get me wrong, we've, there's a ton of them. You know, and then look at the players who've gone out, who have gone. Look at what's gone. Uh, Brandon Barker. We've got... Um, Jaden Sancho. I think Paddy Roberts is done now. He's Paddy Roberts, I think, yeah. is done. done but I'm saying, look at Jaden Sancho as a prime example. He wasn't prepared to stay and fight for the place. Fine, good luck to you. Off you go. But that's the example that we've got Phil Foden. December, I don't think he's going to be a one off. I think we're going to see more and more of this. Again, I'm coming back to when we took over the club. You know, when Abu Dhabi first took over, it was a case of we're going to develop from within. The idea is not to have a team of superstars, it's to build a team. And have they come through? They want us to be self sufficient. Go in the academy itself, have the money they've invested to build it and develop it. And that has to pay for itself. And it is. Yeah, which is why it's so wonderful for all those years of domination that Liverpool had in the 70s and 80s and United mm-hmm. had in the, in, the, in the 90s and thousands. Why they never fucking did anything like we're doing? Exactly. It's so stupid. When, you, when you look back at it, it's like, why? why? That's you had, why United, so had the class, United had the class of 92, which I will say that produced some really good footballers, uh-huh. really good hard-working footballers. And that was their philosophy for how they got to the Champions League final, won it. That was their philosophy. Yeah, but for that was Premier League's focus. All the rest of it. That's what they wanted. That No, but that particular class was their focus. Why did they never go, maybe we need to replicate this for because 10 years? Because they time. thought winning the Champions League was this big, massive thing that it's not, you know? Well, well yeah, we, we know that is the reality of it, but... I'll never still 99% of football fans that aren't us or aren't City fans will still think that it has to be the focus. So, but you're now put down to business again, though. Sorry, Craig, it's yeah. that thing of business again. You know, as well as I do, Rob, when, when we had when we had Mancini here and Mancini went and Pellegrini, it was as sure as God made little green apples. There was a plan. Oh, that was cute. That, Rob. That's good, wasn't it? <laughs> That's been polite. Um, it, it's pure that thing where there's a succession plan. These guys, let's be honest, these guys we've got now, they're businessmen. In any, in any business, as you'll know, you have to know what you're doing six months, 12 months, two years, five years, 10 years. You've got to have that plan in place. You can't see me at the time when Mancini was on board, they, that, Pelle, that uh, Pellegrini wasn't lined up, that Guardiola wasn't lined up. Mm. Everything was lined, ready. Mm. They knew. Still can't explain Mark Hughes, though, can you? No. Um, ah, fucked you there, didn't Easy. <laughs> it was, I think it was the case of, he was there, was British, and it just got the media off the back at the time. Maybe. Um, I don't think there was any. any I don't know. Sven Gran Eriksson with a bit of reinvestment could have actually. No, Sven only came because of his associated Phillies. <laughs> <laughs> Sven was good. He got us a song at Middlesbrough. Um, <laughs> yes, I was there. Mm. Yes. But um, I think in, in terms of that, I think you're saying about Trafford and I can't say that other word, you know what I mean? Uh, other word? Because of the U ends in D. Rags. That'll do. Um, I, I just think that if we're looking at it that way, the people in charge of their club, I think it was Edwards at the time in Gill. I think their idea of succession planning was. Is this the same Gill? Is this the same David Gill that's now on the, the Premier League fucking oh, FA? Whatever. And why is he on there? <laughs> it's nothing to do with you to work, is it? Jobs the boys. Yeah. Anyway, that's an relation to Harvey Weinstein, but that's a different conversation. Um, I'm just wondering though, if if we look at the whole bigger picture and who we've got winning our club now, they never had, and Liverpool as well. It was all built around the here and now. There was never time. There was any real. There was never any real forward planning. You look at the club, the teams they used to have. They'd buy one player, two players. You hear, you hear the players in interviews now saying, "Oh, we'd buy one more player just to freshen it up a little bit year on year." Well, if you look at where we were and where we are now, it was a case of, "Okay, we're going to have a manager in. We're going to have a big culture shock. We need to change the core of the club." Mancini came all right, in. All right. What happens in five years' time at Manchester City when we're still playing the same level of football Mikel and Arteta. still winning the same? No. What happens when we're still playing the same level of football, still win, winning the same trophies, mm-hmm. but instead of doing it with uh, 40, 50 million pound players, we're doing it with players that came through our academy. 
what are the media going to do then? That's when they're going to look so stupid because, That's as you cool. said, in, in 92, United had, or whatever year it was, United had their, their sorry for saying that word, they had their, their young group of laddies that were going to conquer the world, and they did, and that was it. And they, they pretty much never had a plan for that or that, you know? That'll be his wee right record again. Wait, all lays at the wheel now. Are you telling me that United aren't going to be that good this season? Oh, I, I, oh, of course I never said They bought Slabhead. Because okay. all is at the wheel. Yeah, they bought they bought Slabhead. Yeah, they're now trying to offload um, Sanchez to Roma, I think it is, who've been talked. And they need this strike. Oh, so let them get on with it. I can I just, love can them just, the name on. I mean, I, I actually, over the summer, have made a big case, a big case for why City should have signed Harry Maguire. Now, Don't you might... say this, but I agreed with that as well. Jesus, we, we just fucking disagree with something just on principle. Do you know what? No. Anyway, All right. anyway let, let me finish my point and then you can tell me why I'm, I'm actually fucking the fucking Mystic Mega Football. Harry Maguire has gone to Manchester United for 80 plus million and a big, pay, and a big paycheck. Raheem Sterling came to City four years ago now, five years ago, four years ago for 50 million and actually below average paycheck when you look at players like Sanchez and Pogba and all the rest of it. And the media, all of the media, all of the fucking horrible bigoted media said, he's only going for the money. He's only going for this. He's only going for that. Look at all the money he's making, blah, 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 blah. It's a fucking crime. English football's ruined forever. Now, Harry Maguire has just gone to, let's face it, a mid-table team for 80 million plus a massive paycheck. Where are the articles? History. And, and he made it blatantly obvious he was doing it for the money because I think Manchester City were told you come up there maybe 75 and he wants to come to use it's done and we were like no we're no budging off his 70 so they got the 80 off of United I said that again I apologise and he went and he made no qualms about the fact that he wanted the 280,000 a week or whatever it was that it was claimed to be getting and we couldn't have gave him that you know so where, where are the articles that, yeah, but that's that's the thing though. If 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 he hadn't made it so blatant that he was doing it for the money, you would think that there's no need for that, of course, because he said it himself. But, <laughs> you know, he's he's basically says I'm going to United because I'm getting more money. I wanted to go to City, but City almost stumped the money up for me, so I'm going to United. It's like United. Panning, it's like panning for your love. It's like panning for lost love, isn't it? They were my first love. Yeah, and that's what it's all about. Is... Let's try and make people think about. Oh, this is what it used to be like. This is what football used to be like. This is what it was, and this is pure and simple. That's when we were crap, as you were saying earlier about the way football is. This isn't the bit of me coming out, but a 21 year old and a 21 year old Smalling and Jones, if they would have gone to a Pep City. Would have been decent centre half by now. Maguire, Maguire, Maguire is a decent centre half. He's a centre half that I really wanted City to sign, and he would have gone on ten more levels with Pep Guardiola as manager. Now that he's gone to Ole's boss, I think he'll he'll be all right. He'll be probably about the same level as he was at Leicester. How long is it about Ole's bust though? How long but do we really think it'll last? Fucking, it won't kick on. He won't. He won't find another level as a centre half. He's my bet for the first second managerial. Ole, why yeah. he's at the wheel? Oh, he's, he's got he the is. keys to the box. <laughs> Aye, but nobody's told them that they've cut the brakes. Eh? Let's be honest, there were so many issues watching that. If you're watching that club last season, we were down in Brighton winning a winning that silver trophy thing, and they were getting stuck by Wait, Cardiff. This is now. breaking news, Rob. Did we <laughs> win the Premier League? <laughs> yeah, I thought Liverpool won it at Christmas. I thought we I thought got they were, I thought the, No, we, we, we actually got given that trophy out of sympathy. I thought because Liverpool of the, the were 10 wood. points clear and bottled it. No, we I just... You can't use the bottle work. I mean. It was just simply because... We oh, by winning it by too many. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got well, the we, trophy. We were so disrespectful against Watford at Wembley. Oh, I, mean, I know, it's man. atrocious, man. Give them a chance, eh? Yeah, give them a two goals to hard take 10 players off the pitch, yeah. We'll take That's what it's got to come to. Right, so what I want now, we've had an hour and... We've had two hours, actually, of us talking our bollocks about City. But I want to know about you as City fans. So I'm going to ask you, Craig, first. Give me your right. history. Um, I don't want to. <laughs> Do you know what? See my f- you know what my first City game was. Listen, so, I had, I had the one of my, one of my best it. mates. I, well, I had one of my best mates on a podcast the other week, Willie, who I know has been supporting City for a long time. And I know that he's not a glory hunter. 
but the only way he can come across is as a glory hunter. So don't worry about it. Just get 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 over it. No, no, no. You know what my first game was? It was at Ten Castle. It was six one. It was in about. It was either ninety six or ninety eight. It was it, it, it was about then. Um, and I went looking for a wee bit respect of the old man. I had a United top on. A beg your pardon. I will put my Jesus, in a bucket hurt. of water than now, right? I've just given you just two hours looking, of my time. I know, just <laughs> looking for that little bit of respect for the old man that I never got, right? So by the end of the game, I had the shirt off my back and I was singing for City and I was like, you know what? They're, they're just so us. Can just not got a chance of winning anything, but absolute support. They're just, they're, they were just, to me, another heart, you know? And... I went against my old man that day and I'll never regret it. I really won't. But um, yeah, so I have been through a lot of hard times. I've never I've never done what you guys have done and marched around all the first division stadiums or third tier stadiums or whatever. But I have in 86 um, walked, well, not walked, but journeyed through the holy Scotland watching um, my team Hearts, my first team, sorry, Hearts. They got... Um, they got to the last day of the season needing to win or draw when it was two points for the win and a point for the draw. But to win or draw and hope Celtic never won 7-0. Mm-hmm. And we were brilliant all season. <laughs> we got beat 2-0 and Celtic won 7-0 against um, St Mirren. And there was, what, 22 players celebrating on the pitch at St Mirren. You yeah. know, and it was just oh, gut-wrenching, you know, and see my affinity with what you guys have done and my my bond with City, it's more than just somebody took a team when they were younger and started supporting them. I mean, I was what, coming up for 20-year-old, you know, but as I said, I started the match off thinking, oh, I'll get a wee bit of respect off my dad, and I ended the match by singing for City. I really did. It was brilliant, you know, and it wasn't the score. It was, it was nothing. It was just learning more about them and because of the Oasis and stuff and just just, yeah, I was, mate, and that's that's basically my story. It really is. It was that easy, but it was that that strong as well, you know. What about my proposal? Just going on a tangent here about Oasis. What about my proposal? The fact that they actually betrayed everything that was Manchester because they made the living on singing songs about Manchester and yeah. about fucking living in Manchester and all the rest of it. And the second they got rich, they fucked off to London. Well, I'm sorry, but fuck no, Gallagher. He just said that he hates the Scottish, so I'm not. As he said that, right? right now. I said that the other week there, so Liam's my favourite now, anyway. So. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, now, so people like me and Rob were at Main Road in '96 watching City draw against Liverpool when we could have gone on to win that game. Watching Stockport beat us at home. <laughs> watching Stockport beat us at home. We, we're the '99 generation. We're the fucking boring dinosaurs that football doesn't want anymore. Dinosaur, thanks. Yeah, dinosaur, thanks. <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> but I, I've always said, I don't care whether you've discovered Manchester City today, last week, or 50 years ago. It's a calling in life. Yep, very much so. I think it's... Uh, I've I've seen myself. There's a there's a camaraderie amongst the fans I'll put down there. Mm. We have our... I think every club's its own fair share, and a fair share of knobheads, the best way I can use to describe it. But there's that thing you're seeing now where you can see from like, the old fans, you'll see somebody wearing a City shirt or they'll just, like myself, they'll wear a polo shirt or they'll have the pin badge and you'll notice it and it's just that little nod. You know, no matter where you are, how many times you go on your holidays now, you'll see people and they're just a nod or you'll see them come up and go, oh, is that a City shirt? Yeah, and you can see there's that evolving, I don't say family because it's very corporate, but it's an evolving um movement as best way i can do to describe it worldwide and it's yeah. growing it's developing mm. and it's that thing where you can say yeah we're, we're the same now it's not them and us anymore see I had, I, had, I had an instance of that sort of thing in uh, i think 2011 i had the old city badge tattooed on me on my leg and uh, i went to belgium to visit my great uncle's grave because he died at the battle of ypres and some belgian lad walked up to me and went manchester city vincent company mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that for me, that I mean, I've had it as well. Like when I used to live in America in the, in the late two thousands, um, and I used to hand. I've, I've spoke about this before, but I used to hand out my city shirts because I, I only ever bought away city shirts when when you back when they were limited to three four thousand. You remember that they, they didn't used to print that many yeah. of them, and I used to hand all them out to my mates, and they've now started city supporters clubs. 
they didn't have a fucking clue who City were when I was giving them the shirts, but now they fucking know. And there's just something about City now, no matter where you are. You speak to yeah. a, a man of a, a man or a woman of a certain age, and you've just got this bond. And I hope, I hope, and like I said, I, I don't really care whether you've been supporting City a week, a month, or a hundred years. But if you have been supporting City for a few years, I just want you to just take a little time and invest a little bit of yourself into the history of the football club even though we've only existed eight years, <laughs> there's a lot to say about Manchester City and the people of Manchester and the culture of it all that just doesn't really exist. As far as I've seen, even even with Rangers, that I haven't really seen with other clubs. So just invest yourself a little bit of time and just learn about us, learn about the people, learn about the city, learn about the, the, the club, because there's a lot there that will wind you up and drive you nuts and, and, <sighs> and allow you to understand what we've been through. It was only three, four seasons ago when Pep first came in that we were everybody's favourite second team. I mean, oh, there was a big poll done about it, and that's that must have changed by now, eh? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, we hated it. Yeah, you know. But the the history is as is, is good as anybody else's, you know? I've got a big, massive Heart of Midlothian badge on my back, and when I'm abroad, there's not as many people that know about the city badge on my arm, but they do, hearts, Heart of Midlothian, and I'm like, yeah. You know, but when they see the city badge, when I've got my top off and that, they they know who it is. You know, and I think obviously that's getting stronger as well. But yeah, I mean the history is something that although we've only been alive for eight years, we've we've had a brilliant history. You know, I think I think Man City are one of the teams that a lot of people just don't really know too much about. Oh yeah, Rob, give me some of your Manchester City history. Pick, Man, a, pick a story out your ass that you want to tell me about. <laughs> Favourite one for me was a pre-season friendly. It sticks in my head. It was when Sven was there and we ended up in Charleroi for a pre-season friendly. It was the most amazing, amazing uh, instance in my life. A European road Where trip. Charleroi over in Belgium. Right. We had a pre-season Sorry. friendly. Yeah. And it was a days of karate up front. Right. And it was a days where I took my, my lad when he was only little and the pre-season friendly and it just descended into it was only me and him went we decided on a Thursday to go over to watch the game in Belgium and it didn't seem to his mum until the Friday night <laughs> um, ended up going over there and just literally as I said then we were on the Eurostar and breakfast on the Eurostar was something like can of Stella chocolate croissant for me sounds fucking good sign me up <laughs> and um, a chocolate chocolate thing and coke for him getting made up it was quite funny and it ended up with a day where people we didn't know we just got together as a group, and there was eight of us eventually, all piling into a four-seat taxi to get from the station to the ground and being chased through streets of shallow. I've a load of Turkish lads with knives. It's just character building, best way I can describe it. That's my memories and watching Sven's team thinking, in a pre- yeah, we've got a chance here. Until Karadi, it's so high, I think it's still going around now in orbit. Yeah. <laughs> but what, about, was... what about that first derby that season when Giovanni 1-0 United? Oh. I'd love that season, didn't you? You thought, fucking hell. <laughs> Cheeky <leader. laughs> Top half of the table this season. I actually genuinely thought under Sven, I thought, yeah, this is it, we're gonna see a change. And then it just sort of I would say petered out, it sort of knows that. <laughs> it all it all ended up with um the amazing day out at Middlesbrough and all those that were there will know what I mean when I talk about the uh the front of the stand doing the conga, which unfortunately the uh Clear Dunga didn't did the, like. You know, we did the conga at Blackburn as well in two thousand, do you remember that? Yeah, but we didn't have you didn't have the smack smacky with the buttons like I did at that game. <laughs> That was, let's say, it was interesting that the police giving you a battening and the coins flying off from the Middlesbrough fans. It's... How long have you been um, supporting City then, Mr. Mr. Salford? Mr. Salford. Um, I'd say too long, that's a conversation. 40, I oh, was six, so 43 years. 43 years. That's cool. I was, I'd, I'd count that then. You Thanks for that. boring bastard. Yeah. What's it like being next to me at the football, Rob? Hey, what's it like being next to you? Yeah. Oh, I... uh, God, man, I don't have to say it. At which point is when trying to pull you back from going over the barriers to get to the away fans? <laughs> allegedly please say allegedly I'm a nice guy allegedly okay um, I'll say it's interesting that's it's moments shall we say let's just say you're not as live when you're launching over the seats they're in front it's not as easy when you're trying to catch you <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's I think a lot of that comes down to where we are as well I think we've got a group around us now we've been together for a good few seasons now yeah. and I think I think it was historic because obviously where we are in the south it's a bit boisterous and it's developed a bit as a good one. I said they're getting been get a year on year on year on year. And I think what we've got there is I think we've got a good a good click of fans around us now. Yeah, I remember one time some lad turned up with with an haircut that wasn't the short back and sides. 
Yeah. And he was he, <laughs> he was the focus of our fucking hatred for Yeah, we had half of the South Down pointing this one lad singing, What the fucking hell is that? Point to his head. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, having um <laughs> Trying to get the, um, I don't know, I can't remember who it was now, the foreign fan trying to knife the guy in front with him. I was sitting there smoking spliffs. Yeah, Jesus Christ. No, that was the, was that, not I, Feyenoord. That was Feyenoord. Feyenoord. We played Feyenoord where the Feyenoord fans trying to attack Top Knot on his dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's my thing. Just, uh, I'm here for the ride. Uh, now I've, it's again, nothing, sorry, nothing better than having a nice group round you, you know. Yeah, I think it's... Um, well, next time you come down, Craig, you need to get Yeah, good touch. Yeah, I'm going to definitely will. Well. Uh, yeah, because yeah. I think what we'll do is, I think, for me, it's that it's that camaraderie, people you you meet, and it's like there's people I've seen at away games, and I'll be walking through a town, you'll see them, you'll be chatting away, and it's like, oh, how are you doing? And mm. you've got that bond, and the wife will turn around and say, who's that? I know him from the football, and that's it. And it's like, that's all. I don't even know your name properly. I can't remember your name, but I've seen you yeah. there. Therefore, yeah. we are mm. the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that's it. Obviously, I'm from Salford. I'm from the other side of the river. Salford. And uh, <laughs> I just, I said to myself, I rebelled against my old man. Mm. My old man was a red. It was funny that day because it just went from not entering my head to entering my head, entering my heart, and just creating a bond that's lasted so long. You know, it was yeah. just a strange day. Strange, strange day. An epiphany. Yeah. Oh, my old man was a Kilmarnock fan, but we won't talk about that. But my uh, ma's family are all blues, so I've never had that fucking rebellion. Did you maybe, hear, I should, maybe I should rebel. I'm sick of fucking. You hear about your, well. your team last last week? We'll on talk, the roof we'll of talk about st- Scottish football. All oh, right, sorry, <laughs> I've shut up. I think I requested that as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, but look, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't understand really what couldn't essentially make a Manchester City fan because people like me and Rob could quite easily say, "Well, were you there in fucking '96 when we, we drew against Liverpool and got relegated? Yeah. Were you there? Were you there for the for the for the uh, the '99 final? The, not not the '99 final, the semi, but the, but the semis. Good. Were you there for the semis when we fucking Sean got his know, chest? Sean got his chest, fucking got us into the final. I'm sorry, I'm that far away from you, like the Americans. I don't. I, I don't <laughs> no, but get that's what I'm saying. Though, what, that... what makes a Manchester City fan? I mean, like we'll never ever find out what makes a City fan yeah, because yeah, I, I got now their own story. I now go to away games with Rob's son, right. and Rob's son was born when we were fucking playing Gillingham. He was born in '99, yeah. You know, he was, mm-hmm. he was born what two weeks before the final against yeah, Gillingham. But time. before I, before I went to away games with Rob's son, my marker for what makes a City fan was. Were you at fucking Gillingham ninety nine? Oh, yeah. But now it's changed because he's as fucking better and twisted as fucking and, <laughs> as us. <laughs> and I don't know whether that's because of us, but it's different. Never. But there's always some un- unifying factor as to what makes City fans City fans, regardless yeah. whether it's a self depreciation. Like yeah, I mean the, the, the love of hating self. I mean, like we regular sing City's going down with a billion in the bank. Yeah. Or you know, um, we're not really here or, or, or we never win at home, we never win away, we lost last week, we lost today, but we don't give a fuck because we're all pissed, pissed up. up. Yeah. MCFC, okay. Those those things will carry on now for, for, for hopefully a long time. And just that general attitude, I mean, I know for a fact that I, f- I feel in my heart that the money Sheikh Mansour literally could turn out to be a James Bond villain and Pep could walk away and all the players could go, right, well, somehow we've got this clause in our contract where we can all walk away. And we have to field a fucking youth team for five years and we get relegated. I'll still be fucking yeah, there. Man. And I, I guarantee that at least 40,000 other people are still fucking there. Yeah. Because support, it's Manchester City. I support Manchester City, that's it. I support the badge. Exactly. And another, uh, another thing, the way I was brought up with Hutch is the exact same. And it's like been through so much hardship and even seen us win a couple of cups and one of them was in 96. And against Rangers, sorry mate, but uh-huh. it just having that, that wee bit of enjoyment of of having the memories of that, but having such hard times like in 86 and all that, it's just, it's it's like, it's the same sort of fan, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of, one of my first ever games at Main Road, early on in my City watching career, was City beating United 5-1. All right. How, how little I was prepared. For, for what actual life at City was. Yeah. No, we're talking this was nineteen eighty nine, one of my one of my first it wasn't the first, but one of the first few games. Watching City beat United five one with our with our golden generation, if you remember yeah, that yeah. team. How how unprepared I was for fucking life as a Manchester City fan. And then for all of those years in the late eighties and the early nineties, that one of my next door neighbours used to take me to watch City. And he was telling me about the team of seventy six, Dennis Stewart and and all of yeah. these other players. And then he was telling me about the team of sixty eight and sixty nine and seventy. 
and I, as I've discussed with Kim, another another guy that we used to go to the football with, about these videos that we used to buy from the dodgy main road shop about how, how great City used to be. And we had no fucking, we had no bearing or understanding. I mean, Franny Lee, Colin Bell, Mike Summerby, apparently they were all fucking legends. <laughs> but the football I was watching on the main road, the main road on a Saturday was fucking wank, and it was but, it was a million miles removed from all of that. But well, you're not getting the videos and actually seen for yourself what they've done. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah. they weren't them yeah. sort of videos. Was buying from that dodgy video shop, I tell you. <laughs> they, they weren't. I mean, the city store at Main Road was apparently an official city store, but I guarantee you those videos yeah, were not right. They were yeah. hooky, hooky as fuck. But the point, the point I'm trying to make is there was a, there was always a degree of separation from from what my mum and what her dad and what aunties and uncles and friends and all that who were, who were of a certain generation had mm. told me about Manchester City and then me witnessing for myself and me being lied to by that 5-1 result against United because that's that's not all the football carried on, trust no. me. But, you know... you got fans nowadays who look at what we're seeing now yeah. and will turn around and say, I remember watching City score 10 goals at home in the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember goals, watching that, and it's, they'll, they'll laugh at you and say, You are over 10. Yeah, yeah. Is that in a game? You know, you know, Vegas going six sevens at home. Here's I something that's going to be a long time in the future, though. Well, I mean, here's one, here's one thing for you. I mean, when I was at school, um, secondary school, uh, in, in, the, in the 90s, the, the big teams then were teams like Leeds and Oldham and United. Yep. Oldham, you know, so I went to school with Leeds fans and Oldham fans and, and the, the odd Liverpool fan and mainly United fans. I was the only City fan, or the, at least the only yeah. vocal City fan. And I had fuck all to come back at them with. And one thing I hope, one thing I hope and pray is that all of the five-year-olds to 15-year-olds now that are at schools, they will all be City fans, probably. Aye. Unless unless they've got fucking dads that are like, mm, fucking United, blah, blah, blah. That once upon a time were probably Oldham fans. Um, I hope they're not knobheads like those kids were when I was at school. It, we so, will be what we will be. But I think they probably will it. be. They will be, because at the end of the day, that's all to what happens when people are in force-fed success. See, that's a good description. You know, not saying that's what we have, but you've got to see, to appreciate the good times, as we've said before, we discussed before, to appreciate the good times to level right now, you have to have seen bad. Yeah, that's yeah, what I'm saying, that's and they haven't seen it. Well. well, they haven't seen it, and they won't see it. So what does that make them as City fans? That we're just better and old and twisted. Twisted, yeah. If I was if I was a twenty year old now, I've literally seen ten. You know, you probably become conscious enough to actually understand what's going on in the pitch. Probably at around the age of ten, you can go to football before the age of ten, but you're probably only actually fucking figuring it out properly as to what's going on when you was about ten. So if I'm a twenty year old now, your son's age, and I've been watching City for for fifteen years, all I've seen really is City be a fucking successful, consistent Premier League team. Yeah. He's seen, yeah. yeah, he's seen the bad, but he saw the Stuart Pearce era, but yeah. But he I, wouldn't have understood it. I think for me, I think what you'll say, what people are going to be there is that this is where the character comes in of what makes a City fan. And it's it's that something you can't put your finger on. It's that self depreciation It's that acceptance of it. Because at the end of the day, if you look at clubs who have been successful, like a la Trafford, if you look at those clubs, their fans and Chelsea even, they're deserting droves yeah. at that point. That's, you'll only discover that if and when that happens. Mm. Up until well, that point, enjoy the moment. Like, right? Well, <laughs> but going what you said before, though, these are the guys that will go to one game, buy all the shirts, go to the shop, spend the money there, spend 50, 60 quid behind the bars and the food kiosks at a game. Unfortunately, to be successful, that's what it is. You have to have this, um, I don't know, you have a non cynical element, if that's the word, best way of description. You have to have that. If you don't have that, then you won't develop as the business, which we've all agreed is what it is now okay right so what i want to do now boys lads gentlemen men adults thank you <laughs> keep going keep going <laughs> final thoughts <laughs> we've discussed a bunch of shit there and we're all boring old fucking men craig thanks what do you really want to get across what point do you want to hammer across from all of that from all of it is the history and the fact of what we're doing now how good it is and how may long it continue and just, I mean, we have spoke about a lot, so I'm not going to make points about everything we've spoken about. But as I said, just the main thing to take out of it is is to know your history, is to know if you're a newer fan, get the books out, the YouTube videos or whatever, and just have a wee watch and remember who we actually are. And even if I can't come to a game and I'm not there every away game and whatever, I still feel like as much a City fan as you guys do, you know? And may may. Pep system keep evolving and keep working and as you said as long as he's not a Bond villain let's just keep <laughs> it going you know and let's let's see where we get 
but I'm I'm where I am and I'm having to watch the nil nil draws like yesterday and oh saving a penalty to save a point against somebody that's supposed to be an easy beat, you know. We had a couple of good years, but we've done what everybody else does, have a good few years and, and just fade away again, you know. But it's it's nice because you feel like you're still supporting a team that's pitch, you know? you know. It's just like, it's good knowing that you still support a team with all your heart and all your soul that's just not very good as well, you know, because hearts are rubbish. That's what, <laughs> it was, but it's what makes you human, though. That's, yeah. You need yeah. that in your life. Yeah, and my son said to me yesterday as well, he's like, does it matter if we win or we lose? I still enjoy the football matches and I'm exactly. like, well, that's, that's what you go there is to enjoy it, you know? Ima- Im- imagine if the only thing you had in life was success. You wake up in the morning, you get a- an amazing blowjob. You go off to work, you-, you fucking triple your sales figures, you come home, you have the fucking best meal and you didn't even try making it. After a while, it'd become worthless. Yeah, totally. You need- and that's that's why I get the bo- best of both worlds to keep myself grounded. <laughs> it's nicely balanced, you know? <laughs> but I went on one hand, but on the other hand, not so good. An so. absolute Fucking shambles on the over. Yeah. Oh, mate. Don't. Rob? Um, uh, get me pen out, pen out. Give me notes. <laughs> um, for me, I just think it's going through everything, things that jump out. It's no one, again, echoing your comments there, Craig, as well. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are. If you've got your colours, you stick to them. Know your colours. And if you don't know them, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. People will people will tell you. Not... Oh, I'll chat bollocks to you all day if you want to listen. Yeah, I know. I'm near you, remember? <laughs> um, you've got that. You've got the other thing, which is in terms of the game as a whole, the fact that I don't think it's the finished article in terms of the development mentioned at the beginning, the VAR, the mic and the referees, etc. I think there's areas of that that I think need to be improved, looked at, revisited. And I think that that's what needs to be done quickly for fear of that, the, the technology overtaking the game for what it is. I think that's something on my mind because at the end of the day you know regardless of what we say we we may not be the, the large income for a club but at the end of the day we and let's say we are the club that's a bit as we're saying you pick your colors you live with your colors but at the end of the day that's it it's a family and you don't want to lose that that connect in any way so i think in terms of technology there's a, a danger of that alienating the fans and i think that's something we need to be look at or we need to be aware of and consciously aware of at all levels I think that the the mag and the referees again is a key point. I think that will help in in every angle. But most importantly, just remember that we are who we are. We've been bad. We've been we've been properly bad in capital letters underlined. And I've seen us bad. But I think for me, it's that thing where we're here. We're on a ride. We've got a squad that eight years ago, nine years ago, we couldn't even have dreamed about the days when we said we're going to go out and sign Kaka, etc. If you had said Disco, if, have we signed him yet? <laughs> <laughs> but <it's> Disco pants. <laughs> I think that we've um, we, we've got to be realistic, and I think that's the main thing. Enjoy it, enjoy it while it lasts. And we are what we are. But again, this might be old cynical city me talking here now. As we've all said and we've all agreed, it's a rolling stone. It never stops. You never ever will stay at the top, no matter who you are, where you are. Enjoy it now because it will go and it will come back, and that's what happens. And that's my my biggest things that I want anybody to ever take away. Just remember that's the way. Unfortunately, football is. Okay, thanks, Rob. Uh, right, Craig, have you got any shout outs you want to do? Anything um, you should follow you on any social media or any fan channels or anything like I'll that? Give a wee shout out to my kids. Um, KDT, that's actually her name. I know it sounds like KDB, but it's <laughs> KD Taylor, so she gets called KDT. Um, my son, Craig, and my son, Kelvin. Um, and I have got a channel, it's HMFC Fan TV. It's not been going long, but we've been getting quite a, a good few amounts of figures and stuff. And Tech's not up to speed, but it's it's getting there and it's worth a watch if anybody's got the time. So HMFC Fan TV, and thank you very much, mate. Cheers, Paul. Uh, any social media like uh, Twitter or anything like that, Craig? Um, uh, it's exactly the same on Facebook, um, Twitter. My son does the Twitter and that for me. Um, so it's exactly the same on everything else. If you want to get in touch, it's at gmail.com. All right, brilliant. Rob, what are they? What social media? Uh, granddad, dinosaur. <laughs> what social media? What's all this internet? Yeah, internet I've thing. Twitter. I've I trained you in yeah, the game. I love you. No, Rachel stop it. Riley and all the mother birds. Mm-hmm. You said you want to build those websites. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's just short ass. He knows who he is. The one that doesn't do interviews at games. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, just anybody that knows me and everybody else. Just keep the faith. CTID. 
Hey everybody, it's Rob here. Thanks for listening to another one of our podcasts. Uh, I want you guys to remember that you are a community, you are our community. Uh, this channel is for the fans. Uh, so if you like the video on YouTube, hit the like button. If you dislike it, dislike it. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell notification because that will really help you and it help us. Um, the bell notification, basically, whenever we go live with content or whenever we put out a video, you guys will know about it first. And what's better than that, right? Uh, also, with the podcasts, right now, we do put them on YouTube. Uh, if you're a YouTube Premium member, I know that you can download them and listen to them as audio files whenever you want. But we also have a SoundCloud account. Now, SoundCloud is just basically a, a great place to listen to podcasts. Uh, you know, if you're in the home, you can cast it to your television or you can listen to it on your phone or your tablet. Or if you're out and about, you can actually download it to your phone and listen to it on the go if you're going for a run or something like that. So don't forget to check us out on SoundCloud as well as YouTube. Uh, you'll be able to find it at uh, MCFC Fan TV. If you just type that into SoundCloud, SoundCloud has its own app. It also just has a website, which is just soundcloud.com. Uh, thanks again for listening, guys, and we will see you very soon.